So I will be talking about anorexia nervosa today and its effects on bone health. So women with anorexia nervosa can experience profound bone loss and failure to accrue normal bone mass. In a pr prospective cohort analysis at the MGH of uh, 130 women with anorexia, BMD was reduced by at least one standard deviation. Um, which is what we consider osteopenia in at least 92% of the patients and by 2.5 standard deviations in 38% of the patients. And low bone mass was associated with a seven-fold increase in fracture risk. So bone loss and anorexia nervosa is multifactorial. There's estrogen deficiency, nutritional de deficiency, growth hormone resistance, hypercortisolemia, low testosterone, um, abnormalities in hormones involved in appetite regulation such as oxytocin, uh, leptin, um, PPY, and may play a role in bone loss and anorexia nervosa, but that hasn't been quite teased yet. So I'll go over the stuff that has been kind of a little bit more evidence behind it. So the pathophysiology for anorexia nervosa is that there's a reduced bone accrual during adolescent years, and that results to reduced uh, attainment of peak bone mass. And that's an uh, important determinant of future risk uh, for fractures. Bone uh, trabecular and cortical bone sites are both affected in, uh, in anorexia nervosa, although the overall data suggests sites of trabecular bone are more affected severely compared to uh, cortical bone due to the, the profound estrogen deficiency in these women. So in the graph next to uh, in the right, how do I point? No. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, so as you can tell, so the black bars are the patients with anorexia nervosa and those are, uh, the white bars are their normal cohort. So you can see that it's statistically significant. Um, they have reduced C-scores in all sites. So both uh, bone microarchitecture and strength are affected. HRPQCT has shown that adolescent girls have increased cortical uh, porosity and decreased trabecular thickness compared to their normal weight controls. Um, and that can be seen even before you see reductions in their bone mineral density. Um, adult women have reductions in their trabecular number and thickness with increased trabecular separation. So, the growth hormone and IGF axis in anorexia nervosa is a little bit counterintuitive. So puberty is characterized by increases in growth hormone and IGF-1, both of which are bone anabolic. In anorexia nervosa, there's markedly reduced levels of IGF-1, which correlate with lower levels of bone formation markers and BMD. But do, even though we have lower IGF-1 levels, growth hormone concentration is actually elevated, and that's an acquired growth hormone resistance in these women. So when you give them supraphysiologic doses of growth hormone to adult women, it fails to increase um, uh, bone turnover or increase their IGF-1 levels, which kind of is what people are using to say uh, corroborate the fact that they do have growth hormone resistance. The HPA axis in anorexia nervosa, I'm just gonna kind of gloss over this. Um, they're high serum and urinary cortisol levels with normal weight controls, and that's because of the relative state of hypercortisolemia, and that's an app, app that's an adaptive mechanism in anorexia, but it's because uh, cortisol is a gluconeogenic hormone. But we all know the, uh, the effects on bone, so, it's kind of that, so that's why they end up having um, bone loss because of hypercortisolemia. So I kind of went over it very quickly. So if you guys want to come back to this, this is the pathogenesis of um, bone loss and anorexia nervosa. So in adults, they have decreased surrogate markers of bone formation and increased surrogate markers of bone resorption. This is important because that means that there's an uncoupling. In adolescents, there's just reduced, they, they're in a low bone turnover state. So that's a little bit different when you actually get to adults. And that's just in words. So treatment. In the absence of weight and menstrual recovery, patients with anorexia nervosa lose bone mass at an annual rate about, of about 2.6% at the spine and about 2.4% at the hip. Weight gain preferentially increases total hip BMD and um, if you get uh, with menstrual recovery you actually see preferential gain in the spine. So just 
briefly about the therapies. So estrogen therapy, I actually did not know this, but estrogen monotherapy does not effectively increase BMD in women because this actually ends up lowering IGF-1 levels more. So you have to do a physiologic approach in them. So you give them hormone replacement via estrogen uh, replacement and like a trans um, transdermal estradiol patch and then give them cyclical progesterone, which increases spine uh, bone mineral density in adolescents with anorexia. Although complete catch-up doesn't happen because, and the assumption is that there's still other alterations in the other hormonal pathways. Um, the other, so there's, there's not a lot of studies about pharmacologic therapies in these women, but so there's one study, or one randomized control trial of residronate and low transdermal testosterone in women with anorexia nervosa. There were 77 subjects. It was a 12-month uh, study, and they were either randomized to uh, residronate 35 weekly, low, trans, low dose transdermal testosterone patch, or um, combination therapy or they were in the placebo arm. So there were about 20, 19 in each of the, in, in each of the arms. So they did find that residronate did increase the bone mineral density by 3% and that was statistically significant. In the lateral spine by 3.8% and in the hip about 1.9%. Testosterone administration did not affect bone mineral density, whether they were in the combination group or they were in the just testosterone group. So what about alendronate? So there, this is another do double-blind randomized control trial in which patients got alendronate for about 10, uh, 10 milligrams daily in 29 adolescents, again, with anorexia nervosa. So the mean age was 17, which is a little bit lower than um, what we usually end up seeing. So everybody got to, uh, that should be 1,200 milligrams of elemental calcium and 400 units of vitamin D. Femoral neck and lumbar spine, this is confusing. So. Lumbar spine did increase by 4.4% in the and 3.4% in the alendronate group, but that wasn't statistically significant when you compared it to the placebo group. It, it, it wasn't powered enough. But when you looked from baseline to alendronate, that was statistically significant. So from baseline to follow-up, bone mineral density increased at the femoral neck and lumbar spine in those receiving a, a alendronate, but did not increase in those assigned to placebo. Bone mineral density was sub significantly and higher in patients who were weight restored compared to those who remained at a low weight. When you control for body weight, the treatment group assignment still had an independent effect at the femoral neck. And this, the last study that I wanted to present to you guys was teriparatide in um, bone formation, uh, bone formation and, and bone mineral density in adult women with anorexia nervosa. So this is a really small study. It was only about 21 women with anorexia nervosa, um, and they got uh, 20 micrograms of um, for tail and they were given either placebo or the drug for six months. And the primary outcome was change in bone mineral density of the spine and hip by DEXA. At six months, the spine bone mineral density did significantly increase more with uh, teriparatide. Then the, the results remain significant once you um, control for baseline BMI, PN1P, and IGF-1. Changes in, the, it changes in weight, femoral neck, and total hip were comparable in both groups. So you can't say it was because of the, of the weight. So there's no studies currently for prolia in anorexia nervosa. After everything that I looked at, again, and this is what we've all known, that weight, re uh, weight restore restoration and resumption of menstrual cycles is still the best therapy for these women. The reason why, these, why you would give these people medications is if they were, if they were fracturing or they were postmenopausal or they, you know, they were older and they weren't going to have any kids like you know sometimes we see in our clinics 30 40 year olds that are done um they're uh, done reproducing child care <laughs> um and so like at that point you can give them uh bisphosphonates and that would be okay but again giving them helping them restore their weight and menstrual cycle is still the best way of going about it questions i went through it really fast <laughs> Was it 10 minutes? Can you talk about, because I guess something that I would worry about with giving like an anti reservative in these patients, like if they're um, not gaining weight and they're still malnourished, like if they're going to become hypocalcemic or right? So most of the studies, 
didn't see that, but there's a big but with them because they were actually, they were getting psychiatric care. They were, at, some of them, in some of the studies, some of the women's got ad, uh, women got admitted and actually had to, you know, have observed therapy of eating food and stuff like that. So it's not real life because our patients don't get that much support, unfortunately. So that could be a possibility, but in these studies, they didn't see it. Thanks. I'm sorry. Yeah. During this study, uh, what was what was the diet of this patient? They didn't say what the diet was, but they did say that they were all monitored. In other words, they are gaining weight during the study. So, yeah. So it could be. Yeah. yeah for, but in the teriparatide one, they they accounted for the changes in weight, and they still okay. they still saw it. Thank you so much. No problem. So I'm going to be talking about the effects of thyroid disorders on bone. And um, it was first noted that excess thyroid hormone um, had adverse effects on the skeleton by von Recklinghausen in 1891. And he described the long bones of a young woman with hyperthyroidism um, as having a worm-eaten appearance. And then in 1928, Plummer described the bones of patients with hyperthyroidism and multiple fractures as being friable, easily crushed between the fingers, and almost translucent when held up to the light. Um, and then when antithyroid drugs and radioactive iodine were introduced in the 1940s, fortunately having this severe bone disease and hyperthyroidism is pretty rare. However, there is still some bone loss that is seen with thyrotoxicosis. And this all stems from this negative calcium balance that you see with it. And so T3, it increases the expression of various differentiation factors in the osteoclast lineage, leading to um, increased osteoclast production. And then um, thyroid hormone, or T3, also works synergistically with PTH to increase bone resorption and then increases the expression of rank ligand, um, all of which, which increases bone turnover. And actually, the, the rate of remodeling and remineralization is double that of the normal rate. And because you have increased bone resorption, about half of patients have an elevated ionized calcium level. It's typically mild and is associated with a suppressed PTH. And because PTH is low, you have decreased conversion of 25-hydroxy vitamin D to 125-dihydroxy D. Um, and then uh, also with thyrotoxicosis, you have increased metabolism of calcitriol. Um, so this, in combination with the increased gut motility and steatorrhea with thyrotoxicosis, you have decreased calcium absorption. And then to add to the mix, um, you have um, the, the lack of PTH leads to decreased calcium reabsorption at the um, distal convoluted tubule in Lupa Henle, and you get hypercalciuria. Um, so all of this leads to the negative calcium balance and um, low bone density. Um, there's also some thought that hypercalcemia is due to the increased adrenergic tone, um, since it's been shown that the hypercalcemia will resolve once you start propranolol. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the bone turnover rate is double, so this decreases the remodeling cycle by about half to 100 days. And because you have more bone resorption than formation, about 10% of bone is lost with each remodeling cycle. And the reduction in BMD that has been reported in most studies in thyrotoxicosis is about 10 to 20%. And in terms of the microarchitecture changes you see, um, there is increased porosity of cortical bone in thyrotoxicosis um, with an overall greater loss in cortical BMD than trabecular BMD. However, the trabecular bone is affected too and you tend to see decreased volume there. Um, there's a lot of variability in the, the data with regards to whether or not bone loss is reversible once the thyrotoxicosis is treated. However, it does overall appear that at least some is recovered, um, especially after one to four years um, after treatment has started for the thyroid disorder. Um, and in fact, use of antithyroid drugs is associated with a decreased fracture risk independent of the dose that is used. And um, also, if you combine an anti-resorptive agent such as alendronate with a methimazole, you can get an even greater um, gain in BMD than just giving methimazole alone. Um, however, regardless of whether or not you see some BMD recovery, having a prior history of hyperthyroidism does increase your risk of a vertebral fracture and a hip fracture later in life. And, um, a three to fold increased risk of major osteoporotic fractures has been reported and this risk can persist for at least five years following treatment. Um, and in terms of subclinical hyperthyroidism, um, 
This disorder seems to affect the skeleton more so in postmenopausal women, and it's thought that estrogen has a protective effect on the um, impact of T3 on bone. Um, so in postmenopausal women especially, but it has been seen in other populations as well, that you de do see bone loss in subclinical hyperthyroidism, especially in cortical bone. And treatment of subclinical hyperthyroidism with methimazole does result in higher <coughs> distal radius um, bone density in comparison to those who are not treated. Um, in this meta-analysis, um, involving um, both men and women with endogenous subclinical hyperthyroidism um, versus euthyroid patients. They found that those with the thyroid disease had about a 50% higher risk of hip fracture, about a 40% higher risk of any fracture, and about a 75% um, higher risk of clinical spine fractures. And the risk was higher in those who had a TSH of less than 0.1. And then in the open thyro register cohort, um, for each six months, the TSH was below 0.3. The hip fracture risk increased by a factor of 1.07 and the major osteoporotic fracture risk by a factor of 1.05. Um, and then with exogenous TSH suppression in um, thyroid cancer, for example, um, there's also some variability in the data with this, but again, um, postmenopausal women seem to be most affected by this. And, um, and especially in those women who are over the age of 65 and have a TSH of 0.1 or lower, this has been associated with a three to four time greater risk of um, hip and vertebral fracture in one study. Um, however, this study, um, this was actually done in Italy and it was just published last month. And they looked at postmenopausal women with thyroid cancer who, on, who are on suppressive therapy of levothyroxine and followed for about five years. And those who had a TSH target of less than 0.5 had a 10 time greater risk of vertebral fracture than those who had a TSH target above 1.0. Um, and so it's also been looked at in studies whether or not having a low TSH but still within the normal range affects bone health. And in this study, um, patients who are euthyroid but had a TSH at the lower end in normal um, had a higher risk of vertebral fracture. Um, and not only did they have a higher risk of vertebral fracture, but had a higher risk of multiple and more severe vertebral fractures. Um, and in this perspective study, um, they found that a higher free T4 level, still within the normal range, um, resulted in a lower hip BMD and increasing bone loss at the hip. Um, and then those who had, um, who were euthyroid, but had free T4 and free T3 levels at the higher end of normal, um, had a 20 to 30 percent higher risk of a non-vertebral fracture. Um, what about hypothyroidism on bone? So you see the opposite effect where um, bone turnover is slowed. So the remodeling cycle is increased to about 700 days, um, resulting in higher BMD and higher cortical width, um, and a 17% increase in mineralized bone. Um, there, it has been seen in some studies that once you start levothyroxine therapy in these patients, um, the remodeling rate is an increase and you see some increase in bone absorption. Um, however, this is likely transient, has not been seen in all studies, and has not been reported in men. So um, to summarize, so both exogenous and endogenous overt and subclinical hyperthyroidism are associated with um, a decrease in BMD, especially in cortical bone, and a higher fracture risk. The lower the TSH and the longer the duration of the disease, the higher the fracture risk. And um, postmenopausal women seem to be affected more um, in terms of their bone health by subclinical hyperthyroidism and uh, levothyroxine suppression therapy. And for this reason, the um, ATA guidelines for the management of thyroid cancer, they recommend that those who have osteopenia, osteoporosis, are over the age of 60 or postmenopausal have a little bit more lenient um, TSH target. And uh, the ATA hyperthyroidism guidelines, based on all the information I presented to you, if somebody is, has subclinical hyperthyroidism, is at least age 65, has osteoporosis, is postmenopausal, and is not on estrogen or um, bisphosphonate therapy, um, and their TSH is persistently below 0.1, their, their subclinical hyperthyroidism should be treated. And you should consider treatment in those who have a TSH that is 0.1 or higher, but are um, you know, at least 65 years of age and have osteoporosis. 
Um, the, the BMD loss in overt thyrotoxicosis at, le at least seems to be partially reversible. Um, however, that fracture risk still persists. And um, more data are really needed in terms of whether or not people with hypothyroidism who get treated um, do maybe suffer some bone loss and what exactly the clinical implications are of this. It's likely not really an issue, but um, even though you know, levothyroxine is a, a pretty good treatment of hypothyroidism, we're probably not perfectly mimicking physiology. So um, yeah, I think this is just something that needs to be explored a little further. You know, I think you nicely um, pointed out how we don't appreciate, I and mean, the evidence is clear that it really is bad for bones, hyperthyroidism, and um, even subclinical hyperthyroidism. I mean, this notion of TSH suppression with thyroid cancer, um, that works that work came from uh, Andrea Justina um, from Brescia and now from Milan. But I mean, the idea of lightening up a little bit and not to over-suppress these people, particularly if they are a risk for suppressing. And the other point um, with, is that that very interesting history of thyroid toxicosis years ago that is treated, and then you see a patient 20 years later, and they have low bone density. <laughs> so there is this lingering effect even after the thyroid toxicosis is treated. So it's a piece of history that we don't pay a lot of attention to, but we probably should. Is that, I was just curious if you came across or, or interviewed, if um, someone had hyperthyroidism um, earlier in life, like before period of bone approval, or if the whole issue was resolved during um, premenopausal time, is that different as opposed to when we see patients in like late 30s or later where they're perimenopausal? And has already happened. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I did read that in PEDS patients, hyperthyroidism is more rare, but I know like if their epiphyses haven't closed yet, they tend to have more advanced bone age and have more growth of their bones. But yeah, what the effects are on like the peak bone mass, I'm not really sure, but that's a good question. All right, so I'm just going to make this a casual talk. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge the people in the Dr. Pasifici lab who I work with. And basically, we've talked about bone for the past two weeks. And then Dr. Pasifici talked about the microbiota on Tuesday. So I'm done. That's it. That's the whole talk. <laughs> um, but uh, so I guess I apologize for you since you weren't here on Tuesday. But uh, the speaker basically described some interplay between microbiota, gut bacteria, and uh, bone and showed, for example, that uh, microbiota are needed for um, estrogen deficiency, bone loss, and so forth. Um, so I just want to make a brief aside since Dr. Bilzikin and Kay were here in Santa Fe. So in Santa Fe, I did this, a little talk about if um, in estrogen deficiency do uh, T cells or immune cells move from the gut to the bone. So I'll just spend 30 seconds giving you the update since I know you've been waiting for several months. Uh, so for those of you who weren't there, Basically, I had a green mouse model. They have GFP, or a certain similar to GFP, green protein expressed everywhere. And if you shine a laser on a specific part, that converts, photo converts it irreversibly to red. And basically, the idea was we'd shine the intestines and then look at the bone some time later. And if and there's any red in the bone, that must have come from the intestines. Um, so this is the mouse model. Um, and so the idea was that if we do uh, shine intestines in a mouse with estrogen and a mouse that had gotten overectomy without estrogen, we could see if there's a difference in the cell migration. So in Santa Fe, oop, I showed that there were some red cells uh, from flow. Uh, but the problem is, and I should have put a, a, the second one, is that in both OVX and in, in non-estrogen deficient conditions, there was uh, photoconversion in the bone marrow, and that's because we think uh, the surgery itself to, to shine the laser caused stress and inflammation. And, and the difference you can see is, is you know, several percentage points uh, just within the, the samples. So there was such variation that we couldn't tell the difference between OVX and sham conditions. So that project kind of went away. So that's why I say the end, not really. Uh, but this is my favorite comics, PhD comics. He kind of looks like me, I think. Um, 
And I'm in my fifth year, PGY five year at Emory, so when I started, it was to win the Nobel Prize. This is not quite true, I'm vegetarian, so I hope they have veggie pizza. <laughs> but um, happy hour is coming. So I guess now... <laughs> so since we're not doing bone migration uh, or T-cell migration, you, as you remember from the talk that Dr. Pasifici gave, um, you know, uh, um, bone phenotype, we think a lot of it may be inherited, you know, uh, and it's probably true, uh, but, but because we're the same species. But even in mice, <laughs> there are, are the same species of mice. They're supposed to be genetically identical, but some of them have different bone phenotypes. Uh, and so the question becomes then, why is that? And so, as you may guess, we are interested in the microbiota aspect. So this slide actually is from WashU. Um, I forget which group at WashU, but it was just published a few months ago, and they were looking at difference between mice from different sources. So there are three big commercial laboratories that, that I guess, grow mice as a, as a business in the U.S., uh, Jackson, Taconic, and Charles River. And for example, they were looking at this subset of T cells uh, and they, they ordered the mice from these commercial labs and then, you know, took, took them to WashU and said, oh, okay, you know, Charles River mice have more of this type of T cells than Jackson mice and Taconic mice are in the middle. And then the rest of this uh, figure, they showed that these ch uh, kind of changes were maintained even though they through, through two generations at WashU. So it wasn't just the food uh, that they were eating that was different at, say, Jackson or Charles River, but even if they maintained the mice at WashU, um, there were some phenotypic differences. So this got us thinking, is there a difference in bone phenotype between uh, two, the same genetic strain of mice? I mean, you could argue they've been separated for many generations at these commercial labs, but they're, they're basically genetically the same. Uh, is there a difference in the bone phenotype between mice from Jackson and Taconic, and can this difference be due to microbiota? So this um, data I'm about to show you is just literally hot off the, pr not off the press, but I just got it the week before I came here, so it's not published. I don't know if it will be published, um, but just to, to let you know, so we have a Jackson mouse and a Taconic mouse, and basically what the idea is, we're going to house the Jackson mouse in a cage, we're going to house the Taconic mouse in a cage at Emory, and then we're going to put a cage with mixed Jackson and Taconic mice. And the idea is, you know, they're licking each other, they poop in the cage, mice eat each other's poop. Um, the microbiota, if there's any difference in microbiota, they, they kind of swap it. So is there going to be a difference between, you know, this group, this group, and this group? So that's kind of our uh, experimental design. So does anybody have any questions on the experimental design? No. So here are... I would just not be sure about that. Yeah. By, by living together and doing things together yeah. necessarily, yeah. So that is a, a good point. Um, and so we can do uh, um, stool uh, microbiota analysis. And, there, and we've done it. I don't have the data with me, but we've done it. And we showed that uh, if you do Jackson or Taconic alone, after eight weeks housing at Emory, they don't really change their microbiota. And we haven't done this group. Um, and that's because I'm going to show you the data didn't look that great. So we're not sure if we're going to spend the money to do it. But basically, this is we take a, a micro CT and we stick the mouse in the scanner and we scan them. So at the beginning, if you look at week zero, these are Jackson mice and these are Taconic mice. And there's some difference, actually, in, in their BVTV when you first get them. Uh, and then we put the Jackson mice and the Taconic mice together. These are the, the I tried to do blue and red, and then the mix is like a purplish. Uh, so, so unfortunately, I'm not sure what to make of the data. And, and I'm sure Dr. Pasifici will have to talk with me a lot about how to interpret it. But uh, these are, are, of course, the age of the mice is a big variable. So uh, these are eight-week-old mice, or sorry, six-week-old mice when they start, and then they go for eight weeks. And so you see the Jackson mice kind of gain a little bit of bone and taper off. The Taconic mice also gain bone. And then the, the mice that are co-housed, they don't, there's not much difference. So basically, by the end, everything's kind of all mixed together. <laughs> um, and then at the end, we also do vitro CT. So we look at the femur area, and there's no difference after eight weeks between uh, Jackson mouse, Taconic mouse, and then these are the co-housed Jackson and Taconic mouse in the cortical measurements and in the trabecular measurements. There's also no differences. So that's kind of the first experiment. I'm not really sure what to make of it. Basically, um, the co-housing mice, we were trying to expect that, you know, if the, the Taconic mice and the Jackson mice co-housed together should kind of 
follow the trend of one or the other. But at the end, there wasn't any difference in the Jackson to taconic control group. So uh, I'm not really sure if we're going to continue this. Um, I'll talk to Dr. Pasifici and see what he thinks. So I guess I still have two minutes, so I'll continue. So then there are also genetic differences between um, bones of different strains of mice. Uh, so this is a C3H mouse, and they have big bones uh, in their femur, high density. Um, this was done in the 90s, I think even by your group, or I'm not sure which group. Uh, somewhere in New York, the people you know, scan mice. In the 90s, found C3H had bigger bone than and B6 mice. And they were looking at is it uh, how much they eat, how much they move. Uh, um, and the, the idea was it might have been genetic. And it could still be, but this is the experiment that uh, I'm uh, in the process of doing now. Basically, we have a B6 mouse, and we take their poop, or we have a C3 mouse, and we take their poop. And these are our six groups. So we'll have a B6 mouse. We'll treat them with antibiotics to get rid of the gut bacteria. And then we'll put in the B6 poop. And that's kind of the control. We also have a control of no treatment. And then this is the experimental group where we take the stool from the other mouse strain and give it to the B6 mouse after antibiotic treatment. And we do the reverse for the C3H mouse. So that's kind of the idea for looking at if, if the strain difference in bone phenotype can be transferred. Um, so I have preliminary data, but I don't have enough to show. So maybe next few months you can email me if you're curious. Personally, I'm not sure if this is going to be able to account for a very significant factor. Um, I guess Dr. Pasifici thinks maybe, um, but uh, you know, I think there's also genetic differences in these mice. Um, and I think the more interesting experiment, which of course I don't get to do, the, the senior um, staff scientist is doing, is going to take a uh, menopausal uh, mouse stool and transfer it into germ-free mice and see if we can replicate the phenotype from there. Uh, so I have one minute left. I'm going to show you one paper to give you some hope that microbiota may be impactful. So this paper came out of the NIH, um, NIDDK, just a few months ago. And basically, I'm just going to summarize it in two slides. They took, they have lab mice, germ-free mice, and they went out and collected wild mice from around Washington, D.C., where they have their regular lab mice, and they take the stool of the wild mice or the lab mice and give it to the germ-free mice who are pregnant. And then so when the germ-free mice give birth to the offspring, the idea is that um, all the microbiota literally has come from either the wild mice or the lab mice. And then they look at the offspring. So remember, the offspring are, are both you know, the same lab strain, the same germ-free strain that then got exposed. The only thing that's different is exposure of the mom to um, either wild or lab microbiota. And they looked at several different measures. But for example, influenza survival, the wild reconstituted did way better than um, reconstituted with the lab microbiota. Uh, and it was a 92 versus 17% survival in influenza. I, I don't know. That seemed like it was too good to be true almost. But they also looked at other markers like um, um, colon cancer, and they, they basically induced colitis with DSS. And they said, oh, look, the wild one also um, had much less colon cancer. So basically, I want to conclude that there are multiple ways that microbiota affect our immune system, and including bone phenotypes. Um, we're looking at if there's any difference in, in strain or, or inheritance of, of, of osteoporosis phenotype can be affected through microbiota. Um, personally, I'm unclear if it's going to be a clinically major significant factor, but maybe. So stay tuned. So thank you. Had a great two weeks. And here's a picture of Emery. <laughs>
kind of small, 40 people, 20 osteo, uh, sorry, 20 people get probiotics, 20 people are control, and we want to, we get their DEXA one year before and after. I don't know if it's going to show anything. I have a question. Yeah. So you show that, it, like, when you transfer all these bacteria, then they have some viability, right? But what about the microenvironment? Because there are some publications that show that even if you transfer the bacteria, that yeah. is not warranted that it's going to change that microenvironment and that that might have some impact on the like the T cell regulation. Yeah. So I think the question is on uh, in environment. So that WashU paper and also a group at Yale and, and other people, they've looked at even just the same mice, same you know food, same everything housed in different uh, rooms at their university, they would have different <laughs> T cell phenotype. And the, uh, the thought is maybe some get contaminated with you know, SFB, which are these segmentous bacteria that make short chain fatty acids, and maybe some don't. Um, so there is variability in the environment. But for our studies, we use the same room. Uh, and it's in a, in a, so my studies, it's in a, it's not a completely sterile room, but it, we try to make it so all the food is autoclaved, the cages are, are autoclaved, you go in, you have to gown up in like, you know, mask and, and spray your gloves and wear booties and, and, and so it's very like as clean as we can get to prevent um, cross-contamination. So we try to call the environment um, constant in our experiments. If that, is that what you mean? Yeah. What I mean is like the environment around the bacteria. So, you know, they have like some like chorfa and Yeah, uh, chorfa yeah. And so, so for example, for the stool transfer experiment, you know, at first we just did gavage one time of stool. But then there's papers showing um, some bacteria need other bacteria in order to colonize and to attach and to harbor. So uh, I didn't show the data, but the first stool transfer experiment, there was no change. And so we're repeating it, this time gavaging it several times, um, to, just in case maybe the bacteria A needs bacteria B to colonize. So the first gavage, you get bacteria B in, and then the second gavage, bacteria A can grow. So I mean, there's a lot of variables. I'm not sure if, you know, what we'll find. <laughs> I, I'm not too optimistic about this tool transfer experience. I think there's genetic things, but, but I guess my boss thinks maybe. <laughs> so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, good morning. My topic is bariatric surgery and its effects on bone health. And my objectives are to cover what are the effects on bone mineral density, fracture risk, and the mechanisms behind it. So obesity is an epidemic, and it's not going uh, down. So with this, there's a lot of interest in bariatric surgery because of the amount of weight loss that it can produce, and also because it's a durable amount of weight loss, and also it can prevent and also control the obesity-related complications. In the United States, the, birth, the sleeve gastrectomy is the most common one, and this is followed by the gastric bypass. So this is a meta-analysis, and you can see the overall amount of weight loss that occurs in these patients after five years, and also is stratified by types of surgery. And you can see that most of the weight loss occurs within the first six to 12 months in all of the surgery. A little bit more of the weight loss occurs with gastric bypass compared with sleeve gastrectomy. And after that first year, you can have a mild regain, but it tends to be maintained through the five years. So what happens with the bone mineral density? In this study, we are going to see on panel A the bone mineral density assessed by aerial BND at different points at one year after the surgery. And we can see here at the lumbar spine and the distal radius that there is a non-significant increase in the bone mineral density at one year at the lumbar spine and the distal radius. However, at the total hip, we can see a significant decrease at the total hip and femoral neck. And this was seen at minus 5% in the case of the total hip at one year after surgery. And they correlated those two, the total hip and femoral neck, with the weight loss, and they saw that it correlated with the weight loss. That is, the higher the weight loss, the more the decrease in the bone mineral density at those two points, total hip and BND. So you could say, yes, the higher weight loss is seen during that first year, so maybe 
this is correlated with the changes in the bone mineral density. And after that, the changes are in the weight are either increased to maintain. So what happens with B and D after that? So there's, a not, there's not a lot of information with B and D after bariatric surgery, but we have at least one study that I could encounter with B and D at three years after surgery, and those changes in B and D in the total hip and femoral neck and maintain, at maintain. That is, they're low still three years after surgery. So there are a lot of mechanisms that are going on uh, in these patients. Another issue is that DEXA might not be the best um, way to assess bone mineral density in these patients. DEXA has a lot of artifacts in patients with higher BMI and with increase in weight loss. So now there are some articles that are utilizing um, volumetric BND by uh, quantitative CT and also high resolution QCT. And I use this study that was recently published because they also stratify by sex and also by menopausal status. And here on the top, we, we can see the atal BND by DEXA in the total hip and femoral neck. And as expected and consistent with previous studies, we can see a significant decrease in the total hip BND and femoral, knee, and femoral neck BND by DEXA at 6 and 12 months. And the percentage at 12 months was minus 8%. In the spine by atal BND, there was not a significant change in these patients, in the total cohort. However, when you looked at the volumetric BND by a quantitative CT, you can see that there was a significant decrease in the volumetric BND at 6 and 12 months of actually minus 8%. So there's a lot of discrepancy between the atal BND by DEXA and by quantitative CT, and minus 8%, so very significant. And what happens with the appendicular skeleton? So here we can see in the high resolution peripheral QCT that at the radius and at the tibia, there was also a significant decrease at both six and 12 months of, at the end, um, approximately minus 3%. So you could say that the numerical decrease in the peripheral skeleton was less than what was seen in the actual skeleton. But the author of this study said that um, you can also underestimate the changes in the bone mineral density by high resolution QCT when you have significant weight loss. So on this graph, we're going to see the stratification by sex and menopausal status. And we can see that in the case of the total hip, Postmenopausal women started with a lower BND. However, they also, as expected, had a worse uh, changes in the bone mineral density at the total hip. In the spine, so we said that on the axial BND, there was no change by DEXA. And when they stratified by sex, they noticed that men actually had a higher BND at one year after surgery. And when they look at volumetric BND by quantitative CT, every patient, including men, had a lower volumetric BND. So they hypothesized that maybe these men had um, degenerative joint disease that may have biased the DEXA scan, but they all lost uh, bone mineral density at the spine. And in the case of the uh, peripheral QCT, it does matter if it's weight or non-weight varying bone. So the mechanical unloading seems to provoke a more restoration state in weight varying areas like the tibia compared to the, compared to the radius. So it affects bone, but it seems that uh, there's worse um, cortical uh, involvement in the tibia compared to the, compared to the uh, radius by microstructure. But here we can see that in the tibia, postmenopausal woman, as suspected, they had higher CTX levels, and they also had worse volumetric BND in the tibia. They had higher cortical porosity and higher failure load. So 
now we have known about what happens with BND and microstructure, but does this reflect in increasing fractures? Um, it's very controversial for every study that says, oh, maybe yes, you might find another one that says no. And there are some um, studies that say, oh, maybe it's just um, changes in the skeleton that occurs as a mechanical adaptation for the changes in weight loss. But this is one meta-analysis that was published recently, and they stratify by location of um, on the spine, and they saw no statistical significant increase in fractures at the spine or at the hip, but yes, at the upper limbs and at the number tier. And these occur mostly within the first two years of, of surgery. So what are the mechanisms underlying this? So these patients have underlying nutritional deficiencies, vitamin D and calcium deficiencies. They have an, an increase in PTH that is higher than expected for the level of vitamin D, the loss of lean body mass, pure muscle strength, increase in fall rest. They have a high bone turnover marker with a high bone resorption that at least one study showed that is persistent five years after surgery. They have an increasing sclerosis, and there are a lot of hormonal changes that favor bone loss, that is decreasing leptin, decreasing insulin and estrogen, and increasing adiponectin. And lastly, there's a lot of talk lately about bone marrow fat changes that occur in these patients. In this study, they took 30 patients that uh, are, were morbidly obese and underwent gastric bypass. And they saw that by baseline, the higher the bone marrow fat, the lower the volumetric BND at the spine. And what happens after six months? It depends if they are diabetic or not. If they were not diabetic, there were no changes in the volumetric BND at the spine. But if they were diabetic, they actually lost fat at the bone marrow. And the hypothesis is that diabetics, they lose weight, they there is an increase in IGF-1, and that favors the fat bone uh, ratio at the spine. So in conclusion, um, bariatric surgery, and especially gastric bypass, negatively impacts the skeleton, both at the actual and appendicular BND. We need to be aware of the limitations of the imaging, especially in the spine aerial BND. Uh, fracture risk data is controversial, but it suggests that there's an increase in fracture, at least at the upper limbs. And we need to um, pay special attention in these patients, especially in the high-risk population, as we saw uh, postmenopausal women. Thank you. So it is interesting. Um, there is an uh, abstract um, at ASBMR last year that said um, that they tracked these people for five years. This was after Ruin Y. And the bone loss um, equated with weight loss in the first year, as you've shown. And then weight loss stabilizes, and they continue to lose bone. So there's clearly some other mechanisms besides weight loss and unloading, as you pointed out nicely. And they may persist beyond the initial uh, weight loss event. And the other interesting thing, again, fractures are very controversial. But there's, again, the abstract, an abstract that ASBMR suggested that the pattern of fractures changes. So prior to uh, bypass, it's more peripheral fractures. And after um, surgery and weight loss, it is more a postmenopausal central um, tendency to like vertebral fractures as opposed to non-vertebral fractures. Not, not clear, but it's really interesting <coughs> if there is an increase in fracture risk it's maintained and changes in pattern for whatever, whatever reason. So it's really interesting. And sort of as we see more and more of bari bariatric surgery, um, we're going to see more and more of this as an issue that we're going to have to deal with. Yeah. I don't know if it's related to bone at all, but the microbiota also changed. Uh -huh. <laughs> I knew you'd say that. <laughs> yeah, well, of course. Has that been looked at? Henry, that, uh, I mean, I'm sure. Have, but it's controversial. I mean, it changes. That's not controversial. Yeah, but yeah. whether or not that affects anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a key changing, but whether that change is important yeah. uh, is not clear. Thanks.
briefly present a snapshot of the effects of Cushing's uh, syndrome on bone metabolism and uh, bone mineral density. In the next 10 minutes, uh, we will briefly uh, review the description of Cushing's syndrome. Uh, we will also go through the patho physiopathological changes on bone metabolism in patients with Cushing's syndrome. We will review the difference in aerial BMDs uh, in patients with adrenal Cushing's versus Cushing's disease. And I want to just uh, uh, present here um, an idea that uh, was born in the last two weeks after this uh, wonderful preceptorship. So very briefly, we know that Cushing syndrome, um, it's a, a clinical diagnosis. It usually presents with uh, central obesity, rounded faces, abdominal estria, hypertension, and um, a lot of other symptoms uh, that I'm sure like most of us uh, are familiar with. Uh, we divided in two categories, uh, exogenous uh, Cushing syndrome, endogenous Cushing syndrome, and in the endogenous uh, uh, part, we have ACTH dependent and independent, 80% is uh, pituitary tumors, 20% is coming from ectopic ACTH producing tumors, and less than 1% um, are due to a corticotropin releasing hormone producing tumors, and for the 20% of the ACTH independent Cushing's, uh, we know that those, co those tumors uh, are generated in the adrenal glands. So Patients uh, with Cushing's can present uh, with osteoporosis and the prevalence varies between 50 to 59 percent of the cases and this is important to be recognized because historical controls have shown that if we cure, if these patients achieve remission, they can increase bone mineral density as per DEXA scan. The studies are very uh, limited because it's an orphan disease, uh, but the increased BMD at the lumbar spine can go up from 6 to 8 percent. Um, patients can present with just vertebral fractures. So if, you, if we see a patient in clinic with vertebral fractures, uh, we should start looking for other clinical manifestation of Cushing syndrome. And they can also um, have um, a vascular necrosis of the femoral uh, uh, neck. Um, endogenous hypercortisolism, and was demonstrated by Dos Santos, is more important determinant for bone properties than the gonadal status. And this is important because we know patients with Cushing syndrome can have hypogonadism, so I'm going to focus just on the hypercortisolemic effects on the bone uh, today, uh, putting on the side the hypogonadal status that we reviewed in the last two weeks. So the histological changes that we see in patients with uh, hyper endogenous hypercortisolemia, they have decreased trabecular um, volume and low TBS. However, the only predictor for traumatic fracture is the severity of the disease as demonstrated by high urinary free cortisol levels. There is decreased bone formation and mineralization rate, and this is the main uh, driver in this um, uh, disease. And there is an increased bone resorption at a minor degree due to increase uh, in osteoclast number and activity. So very briefly, we know that uh, glucocorticoids have direct effects on the bone, mainly where I place that click because I know the pointer is not uh, working well. So on the osteoblast uh, side of this uh, cartoon, but we can also discuss uh, some indirect effects of uh, glucocorticoids uh, in, in the bones. So if we go to the direct effects, there is an increase in osteoblast uh, um, apoptosis, a decreased differentiation and function that will eventually lead to decreased bone formation, decreased bone quality, decreased bone, bone mass, and increased risk of fracture. There is also a description of osteocytes that will increase apoptosis through caspase 3 uh, that will lead to decreased bone quality, and there is also an effect of glucocorticoids increasing rank, rank ligand that will uh, have an effect on the osteoclast, will increase genesis, decrease apoptosis, and eventually lead to high bone resorption. Now, if we, if we look at the indirect effects of glucocorticoids in the bone, we have uh, in the neuroendocrine system a decreased level of growth hormone and IGF-1 levels that will lead to decreased bone formation. And we have also a minor role on calcium metabolism. So it's been postulated that patients with Cushing syndrome lose the variability on the PTH uh, regulation, so they tend to have higher PTH levels that uh, will eventually lead to increased uh, urinary calcium excretion and like a um, picture of secondary hyperparathyroidism, but this is at a minor role. 
Uh, so all of these changes, uh, along with a decrease in intestinal calcium absorption, will lead to a negative calcium balance, uh, increased bone resorption, decreased bone mass, and increased risk of fracture. And finally, we know that glucocorticoids can cause proximal myopathy that will increase uh, muscle weakness and risk of falls. This is a very recent publication from January of this year. Um, Dr. Gao study in China the effects of hypercortisolism in area bone mineral density. There is very limited data on volumetric BMD uh, in a prospective fashion in patients with uh, adrenal Cushing's versus Cushing's disease, but basically he enrolled 73 patients, 21 uh, had adrenal Cushing's, 34 Cushing's disease, and he had a normal control of 18 patients. And as we can see on the p-values uh, here on your right, this uh, population was a uh, very similar, except by the disease duration that was prolonged uh, in Cushing's disease compared with patients with adrenal Cushing's. He also identified the postmenopausal patients, and as per um, a statistical analysis, it was shown that it does not affect the demographics of this population since the groups were balanced. And uh, he also divided the patients with hypercortisolism in hypogonadal status and eugonadal status, and there was no um, significant, um, statistically significant difference among these groups. So when he measured ACTH levels in patients, um, in normal control patients with adrenal Cushing's and Cushing's disease, as we know, patients with adrenal Cushing's had very uh, lower levels of ACTH, and patients with Cushing's disease tend to have a higher levels compared with normal controls. Um, in regards of the urinary free cortisol, the UFC was significantly elevated in patients with adrenal Cushing's compared with patients with uh, Cushing's disease. Next, he looked at the lumbar, femoral, and whole body BMD on the groups, and it was shown that patients with hypercortisolism had a lower BMD at all sites, but what was, what was statistically significant was a, a decreased lumbar BMD in patients with adrenal Cushing's compared with the patients with Cushing's disease, which is, this is like a novel uh, presentation in the literature. Next, he looked at bone turnover markers, so patients with a, Adrenal Cushing's or Cushing's disease tend to have higher levels of osteocalcin, P1 and P, uh, compared with normal control, so just supporting the pathophysiology that we just reviewed um, two minutes ago. And these patients have increased uh, CTX levels uh, compared with normal controls, again, supporting the path, uh, physiopathological changes in this uh, disease. After that, oh, there, is, there is a picture that is not populating here that I, th I think it's like a Mac or PowerPoint like mismatch, yes. but he tried to do a correlation, a Pearson, a correlation between ACTH concentrations of the lumbar BMD in patients with ad uh, adrenal Cushing's and Cushing's disease, and patients that had Cushing's disease had a positive correlation between the lumbar BMD with the ACTH levels, which hypothesizes a protective effect of ACTH on the bone that is not enough or not strong enough to contrarrest the side effects of hypercortisolemia on the bone. So other studies, if we zoom in on, the, um, on this hypothesis, other studies have shown that if you administer 10 nm of ACTH, this will activate osteoblasts through induction of MC2R, the mineralocortin receptor family and will increase a bone formation. But in this uh, study, it was not a power. So for the, even though they tried to adjust it for thyroid status and many other pituitary hormone status, uh, it was not um, a statistically power. So in conclusions, osteoporosis secondary to Cushing syndrome is a status of decreased bone formation more than increased bone resorption. ACTH independent Cushing's have a greater impact on decreasing BMD and the lumbar spine. And there is a positive correlation of ACTH and lumbar uh, area BMD described um, in patients with Cushing's disease, but larger studies are needed to determine uh, what is the role of this protective effect, if any, and whether this could be a statistically significant. So in future, I wish um, I will I have had a long standing interest in investigating prospectively the changes in bone metabolism in patients with ACTH dependent Cushing syndrome and follow them because the longest like follow up has been reported in the le literature can be like eight months, one year, so that's why I put one year, but hopefully for a prolonged period of time to further 
um, describe what what other like effects of ACTH um, can present on this patient and uh, I would like to see on patients with ectopic Cushing's because all we have is case controls and this is important and we should care about this because we know that when patients get achieved remission they improve the BMDs up to like six to eight percent but uh, we will need more data before we even move to discuss like therapeutic options like bisphosphonates where should we start those at the time of diagnosis of or after remission or there is a role also of teriparatide but I think there is more room uh, to develop the field. Finally I want to say thank you to uh, all of you for listening uh, to this uh, short presentation to Dr. Uh, Billy Sikian for uh, giving us the opportunity to learn during the last uh, two weeks to Endocrine Fellow Foundation and to Dr. Muniapa who is my program director and allowed me to be here during the last two weeks and my intellectual mother Dr. Lynette Neiman who has supported me unconditionally. Thank you. This is Dr. Harvey Cushing's just uh, as an historical report. He described uh, osteoporosis uh, in patients with Cushing's for first time alone when he presented this uh, clinical diagnosis as well. I think he was the famous uh, Harvey Cushing was uh, yeah, to the to the diseases of the adrenal. He was like Fuller Albright in terms of diseases of um, very famous historical figure. I think he was the one who said in Cushing's disease, the bones cut like butter. Mm -hmm. said that? Yeah. What a beautiful, I mean, unfortunate, what a description of what that bones are like. Um, the issue of hyperparathyroidism in Cushing's is interesting. And um, that schematic you showed from Ken Sag did not have PTH on it. The older ones did have a high increase in PTH. And uh, although there are some studies that have shown a uh, high PTH, I think what's really happening is a difference in the frequency and, the pulsation. and amplitude of the pulses in, uh, in hyperadrenalism. And uh, that may be important as opposed to a real increase in PTH. I think your idea of following these people more than one year is very good because all the studies you know are very short term. Yes. And how much do these uh, people recover eventually right. is really not done yet. Yeah. Yeah. I have uh, had two patients that completely recovered BMD mm -hmm. without a by phosphonate therapy with ectopic Cushing's. Uh, that's my main interest because they have a stronger biochemical yeah. phenotype compared with patients with Cushing's disease, but there is more room for, for investigation. Okay, so I will be um, presenting long-acting reversible contraceptives and bone health. We had quite a lot of information about premenopausal um, pre women, so I didn't think that there was really anything that I could add to that. So, um, the first one we're going to look at is um, the depomedroxyprogesterone acetate, which is also known as DMPA or um, Depoprovera or just Depo. And it's an injectable contraceptive used by approximately one in five adolescents and adult women in the US who have had sex. And it's hi a highly effective contraception um, that affords privacy similar to the intrauterine system. And it's, con it's um, convenient um, dose schedule four times a year um, and that makes it appealing to many users, especially adolescents, because they don't have to remember to take it every day. So in a large cohort um, study of women and adolescents initiating contraception, um, unintended pregnancy rates for women using Depo were similar to the rates for women using um, IUDs and implants, um, and significantly lower than the rates for women using combined oral contraceptives, um, like the birth control pill, the patch, and the vaginal ring. So in 2006, a study found that 49% of 6.7 million pregnancies in the U.S. were actually unintended pregnancies, and unintended pregnancy rates were highest among women aged 18 to 19 and 20 to 24 years old. Um, limiting contracept contraceptive options like Depo may disproportionately affect adolescents and disadvantaged women who need um, the contraceptive. So um, just briefly, I know you're 
shocked by seeing the menstrual cycle. But um, essentially, I just want to explain how the depot works. <laughs> so it, it inhibits um, the gonadotropins, um, resulting in decreased um, anovulation and decreased production of estrogen. So essentially, um, um, you don't get the est estradiol rise on these on both of those um, and so oh sorry and so essentially um, you get um, the lining becomes very thin because of that and it, and you get an inhib inhibition of follicular genesis so you don't get any ovulation and this lining stays thin which is why a lot of women become amenorrheic and so because of the um, reduced amount of estrogen, there's concern that um, there may be um, issues with bone density. So um, in that respect, the FDA then in 2004 came up with um, a black box warning for the depot um, for potential um, loss of bone mineral density. So just looking at um, what evidence is out there, during um, puberty, as, you know, as we've discussed, you get um, an accumulation of bone mineral density in both the lumbar and um, femoral neck, and that increases four to six-fold over the three-year period that in females and decreases rapidly after menarche. Um, by two years after menarche, the rate of accumulation um, is pretty much insignificant by then, and studies of adult women demonstrates um, that decrease in bone mineral density of 2 to 8 percent occurs during pregnancy and about 3 to 5 percent during breastfeeding, as we heard um, from Addy. Um, those losses are temporary and usually within 3 to 12 months um, of giving birth or cessation of breastfeeding, um, bone mineral density va um, values return to, pre to almost preconceptual levels. So um, with the DEPO, cross-sectional and longitudinal studies using DEXA um, have evaluated um, what current users look like um, aged 18 to 54 years old. And they have actually shown that there is lower um, bone mineral density in DEPO users compared to non-users, regardless of the anatomical site that's measured. And um, longitudinal studies also reported that um, there's losses of 0.5 to 3.5% at the hip and spine after one year of DEPO use and 57 to 7.5% loss um, after two years of use and 5.2 to 5.4 loss after five years of use. So although the use of depot is associated with loss of bone mineral density, current longitudinal and cross-sectional um, evidence suggests that recovery actually occurs after discontinuing the depot. So the speed and completeness of the recovery differs depending on the duration of use and by anatomical sites. Um, and in trials that included both adults and adolescents with the duration of depot use of um, two to five years, um, follow-up with the follow-up of five years after discontinuation, they found that losses of um, bone mineral density appeared to be um, substantially or fully reversible. Um, however, the recovery at the hip and femoral neck generally took longer um, compared to recovery at the spine. So in a study um, that, rev that was reviewed by um, the FDA from an open-label, non-randomized perspective multi-center study of 389 females aged between 12 and 18 um, with follow-up of five years after discontinuation of DEPO, they found that complete recovery of bone mineral density at the spine, the hip, and the femoral neck was observed in the adolescents who took DEPO for less than two years. Um, however, complete recovery um, at the hip and the femoral neck wasn't observed in all adolescents who used DEPO for more than two years. And it's unknown if these changes um, were observed in adolescents who received DEPO um, and whether they're, if they're clinically significant. So cross-sectional studies um, have also demonstrated that in former adult um, depot users, um, it's, they have similar to, never to people who've never used depot. Um, and so that provides reassurance that the less of, loss of bone mineral density is associated um, with depot use may be transient. So looking at fracture risk, um, so unlike for adult women, um, um, DEXA hasn't really been validated for adolescents as a marker of future fracture risk. So the high quality data, um, there's no high quality data to answer the important clinical question of whether DEPO affects fracture risks in adolescents or adults later in life. And in the US, a prospective cohort study of female military recruits and a cross-sectional study of girls and women with developmental disabilities found that there was an increased risk of fractures for the DEPO users, but these studies had method methodological flaws. So. Um, 
in studies that um, have been done in other countries, um, a case control study of women aged 20 to 24 um, in the UK um, found that there was an increased risk of fracture among women um, who are current users of the depot um, compared to non-users. And um, when women with fractures, um, with fractures probably had um, other risks of osteoporosis porosis that were unrelated to um, the depot. And then in a cohort study of um, depot users, um, also based in the UK, they found that the depot users experienced more fractures than the non-users. But um, before contraception had started, these p patients also, again, probably had higher incidence of fracture risks. And then in a population-based study in Denmark, um, they found that depot use was associated with an increased risk of fracture, but um, the number of depot users in their population was very small. And so they, um, and they had a lot of confounders. So although um, these studies suggest a possible increased risk of fracture in depot users, the results must be interpreted um, with caution because of the um, study design flaws. So going back to the black box warning, um, this warning um, um, stated that prolonged use of depot may result in significant loss of bone mineral density and that the loss is greater the longer the use, um, it, um, that the longer um, depot is used and that the loss may not be completely reversible after discontinuing. So the warning notes that um, it's unknown if depot during adolescence or early adulthood will reduce peak bone mass and increase the risk of osteoporotic fracture in later life um, and cautions that the use of depot beyond two years should um, be considered um, only if other um, contraceptive alternatives are inadequate. So um, the warning is basically based on independent analysis of data from clinical trials and the magnitude and average decrease of bone mineral density observed um, at the total hip and femoral neck were greater, as we said, in lumbar spine in adolescence um, for use for more than two years. And the decrease occurs at time in life when adolescents are normally experiencing significant increase in bone mineral density. Um, and there's a lack of complete recovery at the hip um, at five years following two or more years of dex, um, depot use. So these, again, findings are based on small sample size studies. So because of everything that happened, the WHO then um, in 2005 convened a technical um, um, consultation of the effects of hormonal contraception on bone health. And the experts reviewed the extensive data on um, bone mineral density changes in adolescence um, and considered the findings of these changes and fracture risk um, in the context of the worldwide public health burden of unintended and, and adolescent pregnancy. And they concluded that there um, should be no restriction on the use of depot in women aged 18 to 45, including no restriction on the duration of use. And they also concluded that many females um, younger than the age of 18 and older than the age of 45, the advantage of using depot actually um, outweighs the theoretical safety concerns regarding the fracture risk. And because the data is insufficient to determine if bone mineral density changes lead to increased fracture risk with long-term use, the overall risks and benefits of continuing the depot should be reevaluated over time um, at an individual patient basis. So how do we counsel patients? So we, um, we should inform patients, um, um, women and adolescents, considering initiating depot or continuing the use um, that the method has benefits and risks and discuss the FDA black box warning um, and use um, clinical judgment to assess the appropriateness of use. Um, the effect of depot on bone mineral density and potential fracture risk shouldn't prevent practitioners from prescribing depot um, or continuing use beyond two years. And individual care and counseling is recommended for women with coexisting conditions that may influence bone health as we've discussed over the last two weeks. Um, and then um, conservative measures like reg regular exercise, weight bearing exercise, smoking cessation, age appropriate calcium and vitamin D intake um, should be encouraged for all women. Although there haven't been any studies that um, have showed that these measures will offset the bone mineral density um, use, these recommendations um, will benefit um, the general health, health of the patients. Um, and then as adolescents as well should be counseled um, about their contraceptive methods and um, offered um, the option of initiating or transitioning to another long-acting reversible contraceptive method that have, have been, not really been shown to have any um, effect on bone mineral density, like the IUD and the implant, which are also alternative locks. So other management consideration, just because of all the con um, controversy, 
Um, there was a thought about routine DEXA for these patients, but it's not recommended in adolescents and young women using um, the depot because DEXA hasn't been validated in these populations, as we said. And also, um, although studies in adolescents and women demonstrates that low um, dose estrogen supplementation limits the bone mineral density loss in depot users, um, estrogen supplementation um, during depot use is not recommended um, because of the potential adverse effects and the lack of evidence for, from clinical trials that demonstrate effectiveness in the adolescent population for the prevention of fractures. So just briefly looking at the other long-acting um, reversible contraceptives, the implant is just the small little implant that just goes into the, just um, sub under the skin um, between the two muscles. Um, and the studies that have found that um, stability of bone density with use of this implant is uncertain um, and generally not thought to induce significant bone um, loss despite creation of a relatively hypoestrogenic state similar to um, the depo. And then the levonorgestrel um, intrauterine system, um, there's five of them. Most people know the Mirena, it's commonly used LARC, um, and it's particularly in chronic disease patients, and it's as effective as surgical sterilization. And it's very effective, safe, um, easy to use, low cost, um, and again, no evidence um, of changes in bone density um, as ovulation is not inhibited um, just because it, it, it acts just within the uterus. So in conclusion, the um, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists Committee on Adolescent Healthcare and um, Gynecological Practice came up with the following conclusions and recommendations, pretty much which we've discussed, which I've um, outlined in this talk. Any questions? More than two years of uh, depot Provera, is it covered by carriers? Or? Yes. So even though we have a black box and it says not recommended, mm -hmm. but all the other organizations say it's okay. Yes. So it is covered beyond two years. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And is that that's the standard practice in this special group of the, the high risk? Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Yeah. And in fact, even though it's not um, FDA approved, we're now starting it to use it for abnormal uterine bleeding too. So. It's, um, the problem is that young, young women and even young men, even if bone density goes down a little bit, they are so they're protected by their age. Yep. And even though you might think that's bad, and it probably is bad long term, it, it, they're not going to fracture. So the question is, is that hurting them long term? not so much while they're losing bone density. And mm -hmm. a lot of it is reversible, at least in short term. So mm -hmm. it's a matter of how much more risk it is for pregnancy. And of course, that is right. huge. Mm -hmm. The one good thing about the depot is, well, patients don't really think so, but it does sometimes take up to a year to six, 18 months for fertility to return after you stop it. So it's not a good um, birth control method if someone wants to have a pregnancy within a year of using it. So there is time for the bone to recover. So I was going to talk about um, kind of the interplay of transgender medicine and bone health. Um, just a brief review um, of some of the terminology as it seems to change with each um, reiteration of um, guidelines that come out. Um, but gender identity generally refers to kind of the inner sense of self. Um, and this is thought to, with several studies have shown that there's some biological, environmental, as well as cultural um, factors that contribute to that. Gender dysphoria is, I guess, the preferred term now. I think they were kind of trying to depathogenize the, um, dis the gender identity, the disorder part of that. Um, and the studies have shown that people do well with this gender affirming model of care that we'll talk about. And then one thing that I thought was important to kind of more of the terminology to point out early here is that in prepubertal youth, they've actually shown that the majority of those patients who maybe are diagnosed with gender dysphoria in young age will actually not grow up to um, become transgender adults or even adolescents. And they refer in a lot of the studies to this as persisters or desisters. Um, the persisters go on to be transgender. 
And, and this is where that concept of delaying puberty using the GnRH agonist kind of allows time for the um, kids to kind of uh, explore their gender and, and make decisions, as well as maybe a diagnostic aid for providers, um, family members, et cetera. Um, this is just kind of the prevalence. And again, it's very difficult to study this, especially now and, and particularly in the past. And results have been quite variable. So you can just see the DSM-5 uh, had very low rates, um, essentially. And, and in the Netherlands, they also had, had low rates. And they showed that um, transgender males were more common than transgender females. But other studies have shown that there's really a, an equal ratio. So it's hard to say. And I think it goes to the difficulty it um, points out the difficulty in studying this population. Um, the most recent um, survey that I saw was in 2012, and that was done in the US. And this had a much higher rate of 0.5% in adults and 3% of youth. And also note that there were um, quite a few papers out there that just kind of document the, the, the healthcare disparities that exist in comparison to the cisgender trans, uh, population. So general big picture guidelines or um, treatment strategies in adolescents, like I talked about in the early um, to mid pubertal development. So this is usually Tanner stage two um, is when you can start the pubertal suppressive therapy. And that's most of the time with GnRH analogs. This is thought to be reversible. And that's mostly based on studies um, or looking at patients with precocious puberty and treating them the same way. Um, and then those patients will, once you stop the treatment, they'll resume their spontaneous pubertal development. Um, and then the second step would be kind of if, if appropriate in these persisters um, to add the cross hormone therapy. And in this younger population, you generally kind of start low doses and increase slowly over a couple of years. In the adult um, population, it's, it's fairly similar, similar or comparable to um, hypogonad patients. Um, for transgender males, testosterone is the treatment. And then for transgender females, estrogen is not thought to suppress the endogenous hormones adequately. And so usually an, an, an anti-androgen, typically spironolactone, is needed. So these are the, the newest endocrine society guidelines. Um, the primary risk of pubertal suppression in, this, in these adolescents uh, may include adverse effects on bone mineralization, which can theoreti theoretically be reversed with sex hormone treatment. Um, and they also mentioned the importance of, of counseling patients on the compromised fertility and unknown effects on brain development. Um, and really, there is limited data in general with, with hormone therapy. Um, again, the GnRH analog data often comes from um, patients with um, with not gender identity disorders, but um, gender, sexual and, and gender um, disor genetic disorders. Um, and you can see that, that there's some, seems to be some decreases associated, decreases in Z scores associated with the use of GnRH analog therapy, as you might expect. Now they, they, they note that the BMD doesn't necessarily change, but we know that these are patients that, um, or people that are, um, should be accruing bone mass. And so you'll note the, the decrease in Z scores. Um, and this study also showed this incomplete catch up when they looked at patients, the same cohort at the age of 22. And they found that even after being put on hormonal therapy for five, five and a half years, they, um, their Z scores remained low compared to their um, peers. And I just put this case report in. It's not really important. I think it just goes to show the lack of data when your endocrine guidelines put a case report in there, um, in their guidelines. Um, this is where I was talking about the disorder of sexual development uh, is where we get a lot of this data. And then, um, I already mentioned that. So these are for the, the adult guidelines. This is one of the only times they, they mention bone, really. It seems to be a little upper, up, underrepresented to me, but that's probably biased. Um, we recommend that clinicians obtain BMD measurements when risk factors for osteoporosis exist, specifically if patients have gonadectomies and then stop their hormone therapy. At their, they're at very high risk for bone loss. Um, the, the society that came up with these guidelines reviewed 13 studies um, that they found that showed the effects of sex steroids on bone health in this population. Um, 
kind of as you would expect in female to male, so testosterone um, patients receiving testosterone, they did not find a significant difference in BMD at a year and two years versus their baseline. And then um, similarly, in patients that were receiving, test, receiving estrogen uh, for transgender females, there was an increase in the lumbar spine. Um, the others were not statistically significant, the other sites. Um, that was both at one and two, year two years of treatment. And again, they note the low quality evidence there. Um, these are, again, kind of several studies. They're all pretty small. They do tend to show, um, well, this one was from 1996. They're all small and often old. Um, so they, this one included 35 transgender males, 56 transgender females. They measured BMD as well as bone turnover markers kind of over a one year period. And they found that in the transgender female population, there was decreased bone turnover and increased bone density. Um, however, in the transgender male testosterone, um, testosterone was not as associated with an increase in BMD. They did show increased uh, bone formation markers. Um, and I, I just threw this in there because they, um, this, I can't remember if this is from the guidelines or from another uh, prominent, more recent study that talk about this um, potential relationship of LH and, um, and, and BMD, and maybe we can use that as a surrogate marker, which um, as we talked about yesterday, we're kind of potentially missing lots of unknown, ple potentially pleiotropic effects there. So um, hard to say on that. And um, again, the biggest, I, th I think one of the most important things is to catch these patients who have a gonadectomy and then aren't adherent or stop their hormone therapy or are they at very high risk. And um, there's really no studies looking at how to use the FRAX score, um, the FRAX tool as far, as far as which sex to put in. I think it's kind of similar with the ethnicity tool. Some of one study recommended doing both and then kind of taking an average. So really not much data there. And this is um, kind of a more recent review. They found a lot of articles, a lot of these were case reports and review articles, um, and essentially found um, kind, of, kind of varying results. I point out most of these because there's different hypotheses, hypotheses as to why they got results that they did, such as um, transgender females had osteoporosis, whereas transgender males didn't. And a lot of these are just so confounded by who's getting screened and prior um, estrogen or anti-androgen therapy. Um, and so there's, it's, it is hard to interpret the data that is out there. And this is what they, they say, kind of uh, make sure they get calcium and they should probably be offered vitamin D. There's not, again, no, no data on, on that, but important to remember. And I think um, th I found this interesting. So the, t the current, the term transsexualism was actually coined back in 1923. In 1979, um, there was a, a gender dysphoria association that actually put out standards of care and has continued to update that. And I think despite that long history, there's very little data out there on transgender treatment um, in general, but in particularly with bone health. Um, the guidelines are just are hard to make because there are lots of expert opinion and then small, uh, mostly European studies. And so in the future, um, you know, more, better studies, um, other thoughts that um, might come into play in the future is, is there a role for progestins in this patient, in these patients? Um, what are the risks of, of, old, of hormone therapy in older transgender patients? Um, there really is no fracture data. All of it is bone mineral density when they are looked at. And, um, and then the health disparities, I think, is also something that needs to be addressed. It's, it's hard to change things without addressing that. That's it. Thank you. Learn much more, um, as you would nicely pointed out. We're going to learn much more in the future about this because we don't know that much right now. So, what would you um, thinking about the FRAX um, and thinking about BMD and what database to use mm -hmm. in either of these transgender uh, groups? What would you think we should use in terms of what what database? We have? So, should we use the female database or the male database? 
Well, I guess some of it would depend on when um, the ideal or the kind of expected uh, peak bone mass and when they might have, if they received um, pubertal suppression or not, um, when the transition, I guess, took place. But I do think it's, it's, it's hard to say. And the, the IOF would say, this is easy, because everybody should use a single database. It doesn't matter whether you're identified as your genes would identify you or not. We should all use the female database. So they say, this is the easy part. But I'm not yeah. so sure. Yeah. Should we begin? Yeah. OK. So I'm going to change things up a little bit. I'm just going to present a case. So just follow along with me. So we have a 24-year-old Hispanic female that presents for evaluation of back pain for about a year. That's been progressively getting worse. And she also has um, bilateral hip pain with weakness um, in the legs and the feet for the past two to three months. Um, there was no inciting event or trauma history um, and also noting some fecal and um, urinary incontinence. Um, she has a history of congenital heart um, disease with a pulmonary, congenital pulmonary valve stenosis, um, which she had surgically corrected. The only history, her mother and brother had nephrolithiasis. Um, she's on flexural and Norco uh, for the pain relief. And then her exam was um, positive for four out of five strength in the hips and hyperreflexia in the knees and ankles. Um, so at the time, um, for the pain relief, she was prescribed a medrol dose pack. And then given the chronicity of the symptoms and um, the other associated findings that she was having, or symptoms she was having with the incontinence, an MRI of the lumbar sacral spine was obtained, um, which showed that she had subacute to chronic bilateral sacral insufficiency fractures. So that's kind of where the story begins. So the workup for the diagnosis of these, um, or the etiology of these in sacral insuffic insufficiency fractures um, kind of is going to be summarized in this slide, but it's over a period of time, so just bear with me. So she had a CMP, um, which was notable for slightly elevated total protein, um, just slightly elevated uh, alkaline phosphatase, um, and you see the reference ranges in parentheses afterwards, and her calcium was normal. She had a normal thyroid function. Her PTH was high normal with that um, normal calcium. And her vitamin D um, was uh, low. She was, was 16. Um, and because of the insufficiency fracture, she had a bone density scan done, which showed um, Z scores and um, T scores. Well, Z scores in the lumbar spine consistent with osteoporosis. Um, and then she had some osteopenia in the femoral neck. So because of that, um, some more workup was done. So she had, um, the, her ALKFOS was elevated, she had osteoporosis. So bone-specific bone ALKFOS was also found to be elevated twice um, in two separate occasions, um, 55 and 45, with um, premenopausal reference range being shown there. Um, CTX was OK. Um, and then she had an SPEP, UPEP done in terms of workup for osteoporosis. Um, HIV antibodies was non-reactive. Some more workup. She had a celiac panel that was normal. 24-hour um, urinary calcium was normal. FOS notably low on two separate occasions, 1.6 and 1.3, um, markedly low compared, you know, with a reference range. Um, negative hepatitis panel. Her UA was negative for glucose which you'll see would be important. Um, so at that time, um, she was started on vitamin D replacement, uh, which eventually normalized. And then because of this hypophosphatemia, she had a 24-hour urine FOS done, which ended up coming back um, elevated. So 14%, her fractional excretion of phosphate, um, 300 milligrams in 24 hours, um, which is inappropriately elevated in the setting of hypophosphatemia. So some additional labs were done. So her FGF 23 was 560 with the reference with the upper or normal being less than 180. And subsequently a vitamin D125 was done, which was found to be low. So I think you're probably thinking of the diagnosis. Um, so she was started on calcitriol and potassium phosphate for a replacement and her working diagnosis was tumor induced osteomalacia. But with this diagnosis, the question always is, where is the tumor? So that's kind of where we will also continue with her case. So in terms of her timeline, so we, she was found to have these um, sacral insufficiency fractures. 
And then we found the osteoporosis on the DEXA. Um, we had this working diagnosis of the tumor induced osteomalacia. And then she comes back for a follow up visit and she's pregnant. First trimester pregnancy. <laughs> So that kind of complicates things. Um, so again, where we have to find out where is the tumor. So tumor localization in pregnancy, very hard to do just because this diagnosis um, uses a lot of uh, diagnostic etiologies um, that are not maybe the safest to use in pregnancy. But the safest modality would be MRI without gadolinium. Um, and sure enough, she actually had MRI of um, extremities, chest, abdomen, and pelvis done, which because these tumors can be kind of located anywhere, especially in the soft tissue. Um, her MRI of the femur showed a nonspecific one centimeter lesion in the left greater trochanter. Um, and she was also found to have a bilateral femoral head osteonecrosis as well. Um, so she's pregnant, first trimester. She's had these bilateral sacral insufficiency fractures. She has a lot of pain. She can barely walk. Um, and so the risk of pelvic fractures with ongoing osteomalacia at the time of delivery was a major concern to all of the providers that were seeing her. And she was having worsening proximal muscle weakness. Um, there was difficulty with ambulation. She actually needed a walker. And she was having continued use of narcotics for pain relief, which was causing her MFM providers a lot of um, worry and concern in terms of um, potential effects to the fetus at birth um, as well, too. So, so many different factors kind of complicating this situation with already a, a rare diagnosis to begin with. Um, so at that time, in a multidisciplinary manner, um, it was decided that her one centimeter uh, lesion would be excised in the beginning of the second trimester, which would be the safest in terms of anesthesia risks for um, the mother and the fetus at the time. So this is where her, so this is her actual MRI and that's where her little one centimeter lesion was in the left um, greater trochanter. So just a quick summary of what's happened so far for her. So we kind of went over these things found out she was pregnant and so she went for this up. So her tumor was localized, she was having, having these worsening symptoms, um, the risk of the fractures, especially if um, she proceeded with a vaginal delivery and how that was affect if this tumor was not removed, um, how that would affect delivery. Um, so the plan was for to do the surgical excision. So Aside from all of these decisions being made, she was on the constant um, phosphorus and uh, calcitriol replacement, but her phosphorus was still found to be low um, and she was the doses were being up titrated. Um, and she went underwent the surgery in the first trimester and the pathology was consistent with phosphateric mesenchymal tumor, um, which is what usually the common um, histology is for um, TIO. Uh, yes. Yes, in the pathology report. I don't understand that. How did they, how did they come to that? I mean, from a pathologist's point of view, yeah. how can they say? I, well, they just said based on clinical, um, well, I think they looked at the clinical diagnosis of the patient. That's kind of pushing the mm. limits of their <laughs> it said in the report that they consulted with um, their colleagues at the NIH and everything to kind of get to this clinical, I guess it was more of like a clinical diagnosis along with histo. Um, so, you know, as we will see, in, as, we, or as I've read in case reports, um, this patient also had dramatic pain improvement um, after she had the surgery, like within weeks. Um, and in terms of um, physical limitations, she was able to walk without a walker, which was very, um, consistent with the, the course of events that happen for patients after they have um, excision of the tumor, um, which is like a dramatic change, basically. So sh her supplements were stopped about two to three weeks after her surgery. Given she's still, uh, you know, just taking into account, she's still pregnant at this time when she had the surgery. Um, and her FTF 23 levels, um, you know, markedly improved and normalized along with her alkaline phosphatase as well. So it went from 560 to 61. Um, she did have a vaginal delivery at 37 weeks, but she did have to have induction of labor um, due to IUGR um, for the baby. So I'm going to talk a little bit about tumor-induced osteomalacia. So majority of the cases that are reported are found in adults, but I think from the reported cases, the age range really went from like age 2 to I think 80s, um, with the mean age being 45 years. Um, and then women and men appear to be equally affected. 
Um, and the tumors were mostly of bone and soft tissue origin. Um, and histologically, mostly were classif uh, classified as phosphateric mesenchymal tumors, of, um, over 60% of them. So another term um, for, uh, for tumor-induced osteomalacia is oncogenic um, osteomalacia. It's very rare. Um, it's an acquired form of hypophosphatemic os osteomalacia, um, not to be confused with the hereditary form X-linked um, hy hypophosphatemic um, rickets or hypophosphatemia os osteomalacia, which um, you could kind of delineate between that and this, because biochemically they're about the same, but a family history would help you figure out, you know, earlier onset, um, many members of the family having similar um, signs and symptoms. So there's a deficit in the renal tubular phosphate, phosphate reabsorption that's mediated by FGF23. Um, that the tumor um, produces an excess of. And um, it's a mixed con connective tissue uh, origin, and it's mainly in bone and soft tissue, and they can be anywhere um, all over the body. So the clinical presentation, my patient actually had very similar to what's been um, described in the literature. So fatigue, muscle weakness. With muscle weakness, I would say being one of the main symptoms or the most common symptom, spontaneous fractures, um, and without family history of renal phosphate wasting disorders. Um, biochemically, you find this chronic hypophosphatemia in these patients, um, low vitamin D125 and elevated FGF23, um, along with elevated, inappropriately elevated phosphate excretion in the setting of hypophosphatemia. Um, the problem is the diagnosis is delayed many of times because not many people know about it and because it's so rare um, and not many people pay attention to random biochemical, um, you know, low phosphate levels or, or phosphorus levels, borderline low, um, things of that sort. Um, and usually they're very small tumors, one to four centimeters. So another, another reason why they're hard to find. So what can the tumor do in terms of um, biochemically, biochemically and kind of related to how it affects on um, bone? So it produces humoral factors that inhibit renal phosphate reabsorption, which will lead to the hypophosphatemia that we see and the phosphaturia that you see. Um, and that's mediated by FGF23, which is kind of noted as a phosphatonin um, in this syndrome. Uh, the tumor will inhibit the, uh, basically the conversion of vitamin D to 125 um, by inhibiting the renal 1-alpha hydroxylase activity. Um, and so that's why, that's why you see the low vitamin D 125 and you have the decreased um, phos phosphorus or phosphate reabsorption from the gut. Um, along with the decreased calcium as well too. But the calcium is not, you don't really see that biochemically um, for these patients. Um, despite the normal PTH, um, osteoclastic bone resorption markers can be increased prior to tumor resection. Um, my patient had elevated bone elk foss actually, and her CTX was actually normal, so she didn't kind of fit um, this specific statement. But um, the tumor also itself independently could produce um, a factor that stimulates osteoclastic activity as well, um, despite the normal PTH. So in terms of how it could lead to osteoporosis or, um, in these types of patients. So the diagnostic imaging, um, there is many imaging modalities um, that can be used. Functional imaging has had um, a lot of case reports used, um, and it's very very good because it's, it's a functional tumor, so to speak. So it's, um, the Dota Tate PET scans recently have been used um, a lot for diagnosis, anatomic imaging, um, but again, in pregnancy, what was complicated because we couldn't do CT. And then selective venous sampling. Um, I don't think this is used much, um, but you're looking for a gradient in um, the peripheral FGF23 versus the um, FGF23 level near the tumor. So a gradient above 1.7%, or 1.7. So this is a nice like algorithm algorithm that I found in um, nature in terms of how to kind of go about um, finding the tumor and what, first starting with the medical history and then what type of um, lo tumor localization you can do. And as you can see, cure is at the bottom for um, all of these things if the tumor is removed, um, basically. And the patient's um, physical exam findings and um, complaints dramatically improve if not are completely gone.
Um, so with my patient, um, so one, it's a diagnostic challenge and with not the best of circumstances given the fact that she was found to be pregnant kind of right after the diagnosis was made. There's no previous reported cases of TIO in pregnancy, TIO management in pregnancy that I could find. Um, and then, you know, the if we were, were not able to find it on MRI for her, um, who knows what other imaging modality we could have safely used with her. Although ACOG did mention that um, if really needed like nuclear medicine studies could be done um, uh, then there's like the urgency to um, intervene to treat during pregnancy to prevent pelvic fractures especially during the time of delivery and then the potential impact on the fetal skeletal development I don't think we know the answer to this question at this time or unless anyone else in the room knows in terms of what does um, this do to the baby so in terms of kind of summarizing it, um, it's important to measure the phosphorus when assessing bone pain and fractures, um, especially proximal muscle weakness. And then always remember that tumor localization is kind of the hardest part in terms of um, treating your patients with TIO. And um, just kind of going through a stepwise approach for the tumor localization and just remembering that surgery, surgery like many things in endocrinology, can be curative um, for this disease. Um, if it can't be done, long-term treatment with the supplements is needed um, when you're treating the osteomalacia, basically. So that was my. Thank you. I'm so glad you found it. Yeah. Um, I know. <laughs> it yeah, it's it was a dramatic like night and day in terms of her symptoms, and then after the surgery, she was able to walk. She had her baby. Uh, the baby had IUGR, but I don't know if that was related to this or through something else. But she did deliver the baby at 37 weeks. She went through to term with this. Yeah, and I think I read in the literature that um, even after excision, you could have recurrence. Mm -hmm. But it's a low percentage that do get that do get um, recurrent. So, but they could come back too. So that's all we have. Um, I'm wondering. Her case was mm -hmm. a Hispanic patient, and I, I think someone mentioned also an Hispanic patient here. Do you think there's a race? Um, uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. I didn't see that in the literature. <clears throat> Because there one paper I read was like a, a Chinese cohort, and they had quite a few at their institution. Yeah, there was a big review from the, the Beijing group. Yeah, yeah, I read that paper. Yeah, yeah. Was, they had 240 mm -hmm. cases mm -hmm. of TIO. Mm -hmm. Amazing. In like a pretty short period of time. Yeah. 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 This is Professor Martin. Yeah. Was the head author, and I was involved in that review. That, but that was that was remarkable. Mm -hmm. but it wasn't so much. Uh, it wasn't the idea that there was more, more found in China. Just that China is a big country. <laughs> but um, in our media department, you will remember the the ex police chief who came to see me at the Mali and he came with his wife, who was an endocrinologist. And I asked him, I told you about. It. What was wrong? He couldn't walk, couldn't get out of the chair, and he said, I walk like a duck. And he had the lesion which was right on his calf, and we took it out, and he was completely cured. Mm -hmm. So, uh, he, so it, it really, I don't think it's racial, I don't think it's ethnic, it's certainly not gender, it's anybody can get these mm -hmm. strange mm -hmm. lesions, and they, you say they're tiny, they're tiny, and they cause so much trouble. So, yeah, so very interesting. Are you going to write it up because if, if it's the only case of yeah, so, pregnancy? Right. So I, um, our nephrology colleagues um, back at our home institution are the ones who mainly worked her up. And we were kind of actually on the side end because mm -hmm. the attending I was working with was unfamiliar with what to do with chronic hypophosphate because yeah. we don't really see that so often. So I think in collaboration with them, we will yeah. write it up. Good. Okay. Okay, it works. So I'd like to talk about the quality of life during hypoparathyroidism. So let's start with what happened during hypoparathyroidism. The study, the study found that patients with hypoparathyroidism on treatment with calcium and vitamin D uh, often have symptoms that are suggestive for reduced quality of life. 
So this is one of the last study. As mm, the quality of life could be assessed by SF36. It's a, a simply survey that contains eight domains of quality of life that could be summarized in two domains uh, that represent uh, physical and mental health. So compared to the normal, the control that are the gray, patient with hypoparathyroidism, the light gray, have red a reduction of quality of life in all eight domains of the SF36. So during the ther therapy with calcium and vitamin B D, despite the normal serum calcium level, this patient have redu reduction of quality of life. The next question if, is if the uh, PTH analog could improve the quality of life during hypoparathyroidism. So we all know that there are two PTH analog available, the PTH184 that is approved for the treatment of, of uh, hy hypoparathyroidism, and the PTH134 that is not approved but available. So <laughs> this, this is a study that Dr. Kusan and Dr. Bilizikian did here and on 61 subjects that are treated with PTH184 for one year and then five years. And what they shown is that at baseline, the, in the black, there was a reduction of quality of life in the population in all eight domains of, of the quality of life. Then, after two months of treatment, there was an improved whole domain of quality of life with PTH184 treatment, and this improvement remained through five years of uh, the, the treatment. So PTH184 was able to improve quality of life in this population. But another study uh, that was a randomized control trial on 60 su subject treat with PTH184 for six uh, months did not show an a difference between the treatment group and the placebo uh, group um, in the score of eight, all the eight subscale of PTH of uh, SF36, sorry, and uh, mental and physical health. But it's also true that in this study, the investigator used a fixed dose of 100 microgram of PTH without redu reducing the calcium and vitamin D. So hypercalcemia occurred really uh, frequently in this study and may have hidden the positive effect of PTH analog. And this is the last study that an um, analyzed the quality of life during <coughs> the replace that was the pivotal trial that led to the approval of PTH184 as treatment for chronic hypoparathyroidism. And again, what they found is that there is no difference between the uh, placebo and the treatment group, uh, but in the PTH184 group, they show a significant improvement in some of the domain and in the overall physical health uh, that we didn't found, they didn't found in the placebo. So uh, it seems that the PTH 184 could improve the quality of life, but all, not all the study are, uh, show the same results. Then in Italy, we did this study in 42 subjects with post-surgical chronic hypoparathyroidism. We treat this subject with PTH 134, 20 micrograms twice daily. And we use this dose because it's the only available. And what we, f we study the quality of life after six months of treatment, then after 24 months of treatment, and we found that uh, after six months th there was an, an improvement of quality of life in all domain of SF36 that remain improvement after 24 months. Actually, three domain that are the physical functioning, the role limitation to emotional problem, and the general health have a significant decrease compared this to six months value, but they are still improved compa compared to baseline. And so when I came here, I, th I thought, what I can do? And so me, we, with Dr. Bilezzi, and we started another study uh, evaluating the quality of life during hypoparathyroidism, and these results are not published yet. So uh, we evaluated the quality of life in 20 subjects, received PTH 134 for eight years. Uh, we are wondering if the PTH uh, will improve the quality of life in this population if, if there is a long-term benefit with this, te uh, with this therapy. And uh, what we found is that uh, um, compared to baseline, the, the, um, there is an improvement in both mental and physical health after eight years, and this improvement remain through the, all the study. Actually, the PCS, uh, the value of eight and seven here are Trended higher, but are not really, they don't reach significant. The p value was like 0.59. And um, also, we compare the baseline and the eight year value to the reference uh, population. And what we found is that at baseline, again, we have a reduction of quality of life in all domain, the white, 
all domain of the SF36 compared to black, that are the reference, the American reference population. And then after eight years of, of treatment, uh, uh, five of these eight domains remain still improved compared baseline, and three of these that are the mental health, the social functioning, and the bodily pain are no longer different compared to, uh, to the reference population. That means that come back in the normal range. So to try to understand why some studies show an improvement, other studies didn't show an improvement, we look at this population, divided population in two groups. One that show an improvement, that have shown improvement in quality of life in both mental and physical health after eight years, and another one that did not show an improvement in this uh, in quality of life. And what we found is that at baseline, the patient that shown improvement, the Y, have redu a reduction of quality of life in all the domain compared to the reference po population. On the other hand, the, the gray, that are the people that did not improve in quality of life, at baseline, they don't have a reduction of quality of life because all the domains are uh, not significantly different from the reference population. So the people that did not improve is, is because they didn't have uh, a reduction of quality of life. Looking at this result, we try to find a threshold, a baseline threshold that could help to predict if patient will improve or not. And what we found is that a baseline mental component score below 238, 238, could predict 90% who would show an improvement in both mental and physical health after eight year therapy. And a baseline PCS, physical component summary, below 245 could predict 100% who would show an improvement in both mental and physical health after eight years. And then we validate these uh, thresholds into other population. One of 64 subjects treated for one year with PTH 184, and another one of 30, 32 subjects treated for four years with PTH 184. So in conclusion, the result of this study showed that PTH 184 is able to improve the quality of life, and there is a long-term efficacy of this treatment regarding the, uh, the quality of life in patients with chronic hypoparathyroidism. And the improvement were prominent in patients with impaired baseline quality of life. And so baseline MCS and PCS could predict the improvement of quality of life. What is really important is probably that the future randomized control study should take into account the baseline score of uh, quality of life because probably patients that do not have the uh, reduction of quality of life may not show any additional benefit with this treatment uh, with respect to quality of life. And thank you for your attention for two, these two amazing two weeks. <laughs> Any question? So, um, the study by Tamara Vokes, yes. that was just published, and you touched on it, it was very interesting because that's what you're showing. This was uh, the randomized control clinical trial of PTH1 to 84. <coughs> and that was an international study that had um, Europe, um, North America, and when I say Europe, Western Europe and Eastern Europe. And Eastern Europe was primarily Hungary. That was the country that we had most of the data. Uh, the other Euro Eastern European countries were small numbers. And the Western okay. Europe and the North America group showed for many of these domains an improvement. Yes, the, the, the Hungarian, no. The Italians, no. No, no, the Hungarian. Yeah, the Hungarians did it. And the same thing, the baseline quality of life was higher at baseline. And it's a very interesting comment because to a certain extent, quality of life is perception. And there is this notion of Eastern Europe, and you can help me with this, that um, they get used to their lot, whatever that their lot is. Life isn't so great, but they're used to it. And they don't perceive that their quality of life is so bad. So then they get treated, and they're not perceiving a difference. Anyway, there is a hard, it is an interesting way of thinking about why, but baseline quality of life seems to be very important in our study and, and the uh, clinical trial. If you score low, you're much more likely to show benefit yes. with uh, one of the PTHs. So could it be that in the future, 
like assuming the biochemical markers are, are, are fine, that, that you only treat people who have a, you do a quality of life test yeah. and then you only treat people who have a low one? The actual guidelines suggest that tre the treatment for, yeah. in, the the, in the guidelines. So you both have the same calcium, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. but then if somebody says they're right. feeling good, then you don't treat them. Yeah, but you're using um, PTH for more than, right? I mean, quality of life is actually not, uh, it, we're adding it to, as a guideline for a reason why you might use PTH one day before. Um, but there are five other guidelines. So yeah, the, the quality of, you, if you're gonna do it for screening, and you know, so you could say, well, it's not gonna help quality of life if the baseline quality of life is sort of okay. You don't get but, but there are other reasons. Um, patients on five grams of calcium, three micrograms of calcitriol, and you know that by using PTH you can mitigate that, dose, that burden. Um, you know, the, the, the issue of control with standard therapy, all the comments that we uh, touched on. So I wouldn't say that if quality of life isn't so bad, you won't use PTH, no. That, that's not, not what I would conclude. Other question? Oh, it was, so I was just wondering, I guess, so knowing that there are other reasons, I certainly wouldn't then not do it just for quality of life. But if someone seemed kind of stable and maybe the other indications for needing to pursue PTH weren't um, convincingly there, um, but would you want, should we be including this quality of life um, questionnaire as like screening as part of follow-up for hypopara patients just routinely in case it's there? I guess it would sort of yeah. the next. The SF36 is really easy survey and really quick. The problem is that it's not focused for hypoparathyroid patients. So maybe if we will develop an hypoparathyroid uh, survey, it will be better. Okay, so it's a generic, and the SF36 is no generic, and doesn't, um, it, it's just, there's any different uh, uh, whether we're going to do it with the Yeah, emergency department. Oh, yeah. Maybe with the patient with the hypocalcemia, more often. Just to emphasize, the Danish study that did not show a change in quality of life, there's several things about it. One, it was short. Um, six months. It was randomized. What randomized? Control. But it was a fixed dose of PTH, 100 micrograms. And uh, what, 10 or 15 percent of the, or maybe more, more, developed hypercalcemia. And so that, that confounded the whole study because these people were perhaps not uh, perceiving improvement because they had another reason for their quality of life not to be better. So I don't think, as you pointed out, I wouldn't, it's controversial, yes, not all the studies have shown an improvement, but most of the studies yeah. have shown an improvement, and not universally, and with some subgroup analyses, we're getting a sense of who is more likely to show improvement, and, and um, in, uh, uh, confirming the anecdotal reports that these people will tell you, and that is, I feel so much better, the mental fog is gone, and you know, those of you who have taken care of patients with PTH will hear this. And now there are at least are some metrics to document that sort of feeling that they are, are better. In fact, they are better. Okay. Yeah, I really believe in this yeah. treatment. Also, people say about the, the placebo control trial did not show, your is open label. You cannot expect a placebo effect for five or eight years. Right. Uh, it's that's impossible. Good. <laughs> no, that's a good point. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hi everyone, um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, osteoporosis and its relation to hyponatremia. Um, this is a, a picture of me from over the weekend. We went uh, dancing in New York and Gaia kindly took this picture of me, so I thought I'd show it to everybody. Um, so I think that you know some of you in the audience may feel that hyponatremia and osteoporosis may be a little bit of a blase topic, but you know for the last five years or so I've been learning about, exploring, and, and studying hyponatremia um, with two of my um, 
brilliant mentors, Dr. Stearns and Dr. Verbalis, who I cannot go without mentioning um, at the beginning of this presentation. So very informal discussion. I'll talk about hyponatremia, then a really brief literature review. Um, I'll go to mechanisms of disease contributing to osteoporosis in the setting of hyponatremia. Finally, I'll go through, th through some concluding remarks and then moving forward, um, what, you know, what, what are the areas of interest in, in um, uh, black holes in, in the field. So um, as we all know, hyponatremia is, is really the most frequently encountered metabolic disorder. I just wanted to define mild serum hyponatremia because I'll be going through the talk. Um, a lot of the studies are with mild hyponatremia, so 126 to 134. 7% to 53% is around the estimated incidence and 50% is really due to SIADH. Um, other causes like we all know and see on a daily basis in our consults like medications, hypocortisolism, hypothyroidism, um, cirrhosis, renal disease, and CHF. Um, so mild hyponatremia could affect cognitive dysfunction and thereby gait disability, um, leading to falls and potentially fractures. And it's been associated with a 67-fold increase odds for falling versus normonatremic individuals. But that being said, there's gait instability and risk for falls and fractures. But look, um, there is a possibility that hyponatremia can also contribute independently to bone loss. Um, in the elderly, and that's um, that's going to be the body sort of of this discussion today. So. Um before I get into it, it's really important for us all to understand that one third of the total body sodium is stored in the bone and it's released, um, sodium is released from the bone during prolonged periods of deprivation um, and that requires the resorption of bone matrix, um, similar to the release of stored calcium to compensate for, bone, for calcium deprivation. Um, and this is majorly being seen in um, animals uh, first described in the desert. So just a very brief literature review, um, Cruz and his colleagues in 2015 showed that a single serum sodium value for 14 days, so about subacute hyponatremia, um, before and after imaging showed a modest dose response um, between increasing serum sodium and the total hip bone uh, mineral density and also T-score. In 2015, it was published that um, DEXA patients had at least one hyponatremic interval in the last two years prior to um, bone density studies suggesting more severe and a prolonged duration of hyponatremia is associated with the highest, a higher risk of hyponatremia. Um, in elderly patients, in 2015, Usala et al. Um, at Georgetown uh, studied the association between hyponatremia and osteoporosis, which was dose-dependent and time-dependent, so it really just meant that the more severe degree of osteoporosis, the se more severe degree of bone density um, decrease, and also um, the chronicity of the hyponatremia also mattered in the bone density. So the longer the hyponatremic you were, the greater the degree of bone density loss as well. And then in 2008, it was published that mild asymptomatic hyponatremia associated with increased bone fracture incidence in um, ambulatory patients in the elderly, but this has not been shown since. Um, finally, in 2010, Dr. Verbalis um, studied that hyponatremia was independently associated with increased odds of low mineral bone density um, in a sample size of adults that were over the age of 50 years old. Um, he included patients that did not have calcium disorders, they, so nor did they have hyper nor hypocalcemia, um, and they also had normal kidney function. So um, he basically did two experiments. He took rats um, and he induced iatrogenic hyponatremia, giving them DDAVP. He also did um, a liquid diet, a solid diet, and then DDAVP with a liquid diet and vitamin D. It's important to note that in previous studies, they did in try to induce hyponatremia in rats by giving them just a low sodium diet. It didn't actually make the, the rats hyponatremic. They were normonatremic and they did not show any reduction in bone density. So you really need to be hyponatremic to see that reduction in bone density. It's not just about the low sodium diet. It's about being hyponatremic. Um, so as you can see here, there was a 30% reduction in bone density in um, the rats that had iatrogenic induced hyponatremia from the DDAVP, 30% reduction in bone density and that was at the femoral, um, a fo the femoral neck and hyponatremic rats. I finally know what uh, how to interpret a 4D CT. Thank you to this course. So there is um, there was also. Um, there was also decrease in all parameters on the 4-DCT um, that was done in these hyponatremic rats as compared to um, control rats um, in, uh, in this study. And there was also a decline of trabecular and cortical bone parameters um, 
as well. So um, here, so similarly, um, histologically, yeah, it, it, you can see that um, hyponatremia reduced both, both trabecular and cortical bone contents. Um, and then I think probably the most um, striking histological finding was that there is an increased density or number of osteoclasts in um, a given bone area in this study. So um, this, was, this was really just to show that there was a kind of marked decrease in all bone density parameters across the board um, in these hyponatremic rats. So I think the most um, pressing and perhaps the most interesting um, topic of discussion is why does this happen? We all see that it happens, but why does this happen? Um, and the, the truth is, um, it's not set in stone, but there's a lot of very interesting hypotheses. So I'll go through that. Um, I'll go through that here. So before I start with that, the umbrella is that there is a market activation of osteoblastic bone resorption. Um, and this has been consistent with prior reports. Um, there's been, like I mentioned, release of sodium stores from the bone that requires this resorptive activity. So as we all know, in the osteoclast, there's a sodium-calcium uh, uh, influx um, transporter that is really bidirectional. So it's, um, it's sort of intuitive to think that if your extracellular sodium is low, you'll have an efflux of sodium and then an influx of calcium because the system is bidirectional. And so if you propose that perhaps if you make a cell medium hyponatremic, you would think intuitively, and also from prior studies, that there'd be an increased efflux of sodium outside the cell and then an influx of calcium but Dr. Barsoni actually studied this and she made um, the cell medium hyponatremic and in fact she found the opposite. So she found that it, the, the transporter actually went unidirectionally. So as the sodium was effluxed out of the cell, as was the calcium. So as you can see in this osteoclastic cell, the calcium um, goes down proportionally to the sodium. So there was a dramatic de um, decrease at a lower sodium as opposed to a sort of um, a sodium that was like mild, mildly hyponatremic. So that's one theory. So the second theory has to do with ascorbic acid. Um, I apologize, this, this graph kind of got cut off here. But the second theory has to do with ascorbic acid. So um, we all know that um, ascorbic acid is, or there's been a proposed theory, I should say, we all know, but there's been a proposed theory that ascorbic acid um, increases the activity of osteoclasts and, and bone resorption. And so um, in her lab, Dr. Barsoni proposed that perhaps in, hyponatremic, in a hyponatremic medium, you also have a decreased or a reduced um, ascorbic acid. And that may contribute as well to this increased bone resorption or increased osteoclastic activity. Um, and what she actually found was that when she made the hyponatremic medium, there was a decrease in ascorbic acid. Um, and the story doesn't end there. Um, it actually continues because we all know that in previous studies, in mediums where ascorbic acid, there's a deficiency of ascorbic acid, is he? No, he's good. Okay. Um, where there's a deficiency of ascorbic acid, you also increase the amount of um, reactive oxygen species. So there's an increased amount of reactive oxygen species, and there's also a theory that reactive oxygen species is actually one of the most important um, modulators of rank L, induced osteoclastogenesis. And so what she did was was um, was very intuitive. So basically, she took these she took this hyponatremic medium where there was a reduced amount of osteo um, reduced amount of ascorbic acid, and she measured. Um, dihydrochlorohydrofluorescent dictate, which is, or 2 prime, two prime 9 prime um, DCF, also known as DCF, which is a reactive oxygen N species. And she actually found that there was a twofold increase of reactive oxygen species in this environment where there's lower ascorbic acid and in this environment where there's, um, with, with hyponatremia. And then she, um, put in H2O2 and found that there was a sevenfold increase in DCF um, in these osteoclastic cells. So there was a sevenfold stimulation of osteoclastic cells in this cultured medium. Um, so those were those are the, the two major hypotheses of why hyponatremia causes um, increased osteoclastogenesis and bone resorption. Um, so I think we can all appreciate and understand these hypotheses moving forward. Uh, moving forward, but there's obviously a lot of areas that still need to be tapped into and explored. So con my concluding remarks is really that bone quality should be assessed. Obviously, in all patients with hyponatremia, an appropriate treatment um, should be initiated where indicated. 
it's very difficult to say that hyponatremia isolated can cause osteoporosis. So I wouldn't be so bold to say that, but I would be so bold to say that there's a synchronicity of, of factors that come together. Um, and so when you have elderly patients with all of these potential um, risk factors uh, in contributing to osteoporosis, please be uh, cognizant um, of, of potential uh, chronic hyponatremia that may be exacerbating this. Um, areas of interest, I think, moving forward from what I've um, from what I've read and, and had the opportunity to learn in the last couple of years is activation of similar metabolic pathways and other cells and tissues can be responsible for associations between hyponatremia and perhaps poor clinical outcome. Um, mechanism of sodium sensing and um, sodium concentration dependent activation of osteoclasts. And there's also L-glutamic acid phosphorus and bicarb transporters that are also in the oste osteoclastic cell. So there's a, those are other transporters that we could potentially tap into to find out and further explain the possible pathogenesis of why hyponatremia causes increased bone resorption. Um, I do want to thank first and foremost Dr. Belizikin for bringing us all here and the Endocrine Fellows Foundation. I want to thank my program director Dr. Verbalis. Um, thank you to Dr. Barsoni for um, doing all these studies and allowing me to learn from them and of course um, to Dr. Berman uh, who is my program director and has been an unconditional um, source of strength and support for me in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, I think everybody knows who this is. So this is, um, this is Frida Kahlo. Uh, she is one of the most influential artists of all time. Um, Frida was in uh, an accident in 1925. She was in a very big bus accident where she essentially broke almost every bone in her body. Um, and a part of the bus actually went through her uterus. So you can only imagine the extent of her of her suffering. Um, the reason I put this here is because obviously, as we know, fractures can be debilitating. But she actually took all of that. And her pain was um, sort of um, put into her art and there was a very particular piece that she did where she was sitting in her guard armor with a with a rifle to her throat so it really just shows you how um, how not only painful in the physical sense but mental emotional sense that that this can be moving forward and I am so incredibly grateful to be here and to take everything that we've learned back to my university and back to my community to be able to help these people so thank you so much So do the yeah. lights today, like the ones that are hyponatremic, do they eat? Yeah, so they did. Um, so they had the same amount of activity, but they did not eat the same amount. So there was mice that had solid diets, and then mice that had liquid diets. So they had very specific diets. So they were supposed to induce um, diet, induced hyponatremia, which didn't happen. It was only iatrogenic hyponatremia from the DDAVP. Was that your question? Okay. <laughs> Uh, there was a paper a couple months ago, I think it was in Nature, where they tried to show that you know, the cardiovascular effects of a high salt diet mm -hmm. that cause high blood pressure in months or rats, you know, right, were in part mediated through microbiota where they did, I think, germ-free or antibiotic treatment and high salt couldn't cause high blood pressure. So maybe there's a lot Maybe we can team up. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Is the fact that um, calcium and sodium e yeah. being unidirectional the reason why high salt diets can lead to hypercalciuria and, and contribute to bone loss? That you, know? you know, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I would intuitively think so that now that you mentioned it, but I'll, I'd have to look further read and then let you know. But I would, I would, I would think so. But I, I don't know the answer to that. So I'll have to let you know. Yeah. Oh, great. To be continued. Stay tuned. <laughs> uh, Dr. Barbalis, I can't remember when he came. It was a good 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago. I invited him to come to give a seminar, and he was just making this observation. And it was, he's, just, he's a fabulous scientist yeah. and speaker. And I was thinking that you know, he's got something. He's really making an observation that is going to tell us something. And he, and 10 years he later, <laughs> he really did. He sent me to tell you. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good morning. Um, first of all, I would like to present a short case. 
So um, this is my patient, so 63 years old female with an invasive ductal carcinoma of the left breast, have a status bone lumpectomy and sentinel lymph node dissection. She also have a radiation therapy. So after this, she has a postmenopausal and an invasive ductal carcinoma. So she will put on the aromatase inhibitor as a mistake for about in here is about nine months. So she, the consult, she was uh, referred to as for the progressive worsening of the vertebral osteoporosis. So she has other risk factor for the osteoporosis, like you know, impaired glucose and other um, basis some um, side um, past medical history. And she also have menopause at the age of 40, but not on any HRT. She is a chronic smoker, also have a family history of osteoporosis. So medication history, she is not any kind of um, chronic steroid, but um, in her lifetime, she exposed like steroid injection in the bed for about at least four times. So initially she will put on Nestrozor. Again, there is a um, um, third generation uh, aromatase inhibitor. And after that, it was stopped because of the side effect. And after that, she was put on the SMS day. So again, the same uh, aromatase inhibitor, third generation. So, and after that, uh, you can see the timeline here. So in the February 2017, she will put on the AI. And um, about 20, um, July of the 2017, she will put on the Ivan Journey 150Q uh, monthly. She already on the calcium and vitamin D for a few years and other medication, as you can see in the list. So uh, she came to see us. She has a, really have a um, decreased activity because of the pain. Back pain is a main um, concern for her and they're very uh, difficult to standing for a long time, a long duration because of that pain and also unable to work. So it's really kind of like debilitating at that stage. So physical examination is really not uh, remarkable, but my tenderness over the low mid -bed, lower mid-bed. So labs are, we don't have a lot of labs in that system. So when we see her, uh, we don't even have a vitamin D25 level, but uh, she is on the calcium vitamin D, as I mentioned, for a couple of years already. So uh, from the report, there is uh, um, a timeline. It's a February at the time they're about to start the AI. So she has a Dexter done, but we didn't have a chance to um, uh, review the image. So we just got the report. So you can see the T score at the lumbar spine was already minus 2.4, and then L3 was minus 3.2. So she already had the osteoporotic range. So uh, what happened was that after they start the SMS day, and then in November she has a fall and she visited the ER, you can see that there is a TA, so there is a compression, oh sorry, I didn't see the, so there is a compression fracture of the TA. So also have a degenerated changes and then compression fracture at the L4. So what happened was that she ended when the T8 and the L4 vertebroplasty, and then she also got the biopsy done because they were concerned whether there is a metastasis or not, but only the chronic inflammatory changes. But one week after, uh, about 10 days after that procedure, she went back to the ER again because of the back pain. So I guess you can see that there is the T8, uh, the white one is the vertebral plasty that was done, and then um, there is the new vertebral fracture in the T compression fracture in T9 with loss of less than 25% of her vertebral kind of um, high. So there is the timeline comparison. So she had a like, subsequent three vertebral fracture there uh, within like 10 days. So uh, my topic is about to discuss the uh, aromatase inhibitor induced bone loss, which is the AIMBL. So first, we'll talk quickly talk about the breast cancer, which is the leading cause of the premature uh, mortality and morbidity more worldwide in the woman. So uh, more than 800,000 women are diagnosed with breast cancer, and 60% of breast cancer patients express homoreceptor, which is the estrogen receptor or progesterone receptor. So in the postmenopausal women with the homoreceptor positive breast cancer, so they're treated with the, uh, blocking those receptors by the serum tamoxifen or by reducing the production of the estrogen with the aromatase inhibitor. So these are the two guide standard kind of treatment. So aromatase inhibitor, um, as Dr. B already mentioned yesterday about uh, AI, so these are really powerful medications. So it's kind of convert the block in the conversion of the androgen to estrogen in the peripheral tissue and then lower the cycle in estrogen. So you can have the lower down that estrogen level more than 99% within few weeks. So that increase the bone turnover and increase bone loss and the fracture risk. So so why they choose the AI in the postmenopausal woman with the Asia positive? Because there are a lot of the data they mentioned that uh, that medication is increased efficacy and also reduce the incidence of endometrial cancer um, and then um, thromboembolism compared with the tamoxifen. So tamoxifen is again a serum, so it can kind of like protect the postmenopausal bone loss, but they are not really using it as a first line because of that. Um, AIs are really well tolerated and also have a low incidence of the short-term adverse effect. As you can see, there are common adverse effects are like hot flushes and vaginal dryness. Most of the patients will complain about the musculoskeletal pain. 
So these are the category of the AI. So again, third generation AI is the right currently using medications. So there are two types, steroid inhibitor and the non-steroid inhibitor has to missing and the NS2 is also the most of the um, study and the most of the medication that you use, mainly uh, main medication that they use for treatment. So what is the effect of the AI on the bone mineral density? So there is a study done to just to see, the objective is to see what is the effect of asthma staying on the bone mineral density. So this includes the 128 postmenopausal woman with early breast cancer. So asthma staying 25 milligram or placebo to group for two years. There's a double blind study. As you can see that the blood one is uh, the blood one there in the graph is a placebo group. And then the dotted lines are asthma stays. So there is a modestly uh, asthma staying can really enhance the bone loss, mainly in the femur and neck, and then in that study, they mentioned that not significantly in the lumbar spine, but they can in, um, reduce the bone loss in uh, both um, lumbar spine and femur and neck. So there are a couple of studies done. This is the study, see the, what is the effect of the anastrozole and then um, tamoxifen on the bone density, like percent change from bone density. So uh, it's the uh, kind of study one year, two years, and after five years, as you can significantly see that, there is a, the yellow line is the tamoxifen group, and then um, the blue line is the anastrozole group. So the um, anastrozole is kind of, you know, uh, enhanced bone loss in um, the, the, the whole uh, kind of like study period. So um, this study include 147 patients. So as you can see, there is a percent changes in the, um, this study. So uh, how about the fracture? Honestly saying there are a couple of those uh, major studies done, but none of these studies are looking at the, uh, the fracture as their primary event. So they are only collecting the fracture data as kind of uh, long-term safety or the tolerability kind of like effect. So as you can see, all these studies compare the um, AI and the tamoxifen or you know AI after two, three years of tamoxifen. All these first four studies, they also show that the clinical fracture rates are higher in the AI group. Only there is the last one, which is the ME17 study. So in that study, is to compare letrozole and the placebo group. So in the study, they gave like five years of tamoxifen first, and then after that, they switched to the AI. So it's kind of like protected action on the bone loss in those groups, so that clinical fracture rate is 5.3 and 4.6, so it's not clinically kind of like significant. So it's kind of like maybe that it will be the you know plan that like you give the patient for five years tamoxifen, and after the switch to AI, that will be a solution. So with this study, but again, these are not really looking as a clinical or uh, the fracture as an outcome. So mainly when we evaluate the EIM bill, so the main thing is the uh, fracture risk assessment, make the same thing as we assess for the osteoporosis and then bone mineral density by the dexter. Lab evaluation is a basic lab work and then pharmacological therapy, as we all know, that increase the physical activities or the smoking cessation or vitamin D and calcium supplement. So how about the pharmacological therapy? Um, there is a no treatment is specifically approved or you know, kind of like a gold standard for that EIBL, but there are a couple, a lot of study about the bisphosphonate and the denosumab. So mainly the bisphosphonate is the interventional choice for the low BMD. Uh, also uh, the evidence of the rapid bone turnover because it's a cause is favorable and also kind of like a lot of long-term study data. So there, even in the bisphosphonate, which one we have to choose, like oral bisphosphonate, whether we should choose a weekly uh, residronate or alendronate in uh, my patient is on alendronate, uh, whether there is a good choice for her or not. So we will discuss a couple of studies here. And about the IV bisphosphonate, most of the study use a 4 milligram IV or solendronate for every six months. So that is kind of like favorable medication. Also alternative option, we have a denosumab. We have a couple of studies about the denosumab too. So this is kind of uh, summarization, but we don't have to read all these things, but there are a couple of uh, some society uh, recommend. You can use either one, it's fine in um, their uh, recommendation, but um, you know you have to use the medication as long as patient is on EI therapy. So current oncology, they are using that for like five years, but the certain, um, uh, maybe like, you know, particular patient, they have to use like up to 10 years. So as long as patient is on the AI, you have to give that. Uh, some of the medication, hypersoptic medication. Okay, so let me talk about this thing. Um, this is the ZFS trial. So this trial is uh, Zomator and the femoral adjuvant synergy trial. So this study includes 602 patients. They divided the patient into two groups. So one is the upfront group, uh, which means that patient uh, with the, uh, when they start the letrozole AI, so they will start the zolendronate acid Q6 at the same time, which is called the upfront group. So delay group means that they won't start the medication at the same time. Patient will only get the aromatase inhibitor and then they will initiate the bisphosphonate when patient has a lumbar spine or total hip 
t score of less than negative two or no traumatic, non traumatic fracture, and then at the time they would start the delay. Um, so as you can see, the blue bar is all our afferent group and the yellow bar is a delayed group. So in 12 men, the lumbar spine in all these uh, afferent group has increased 4.4% higher in the afferent group compared to those uh, delayed group. Also with the total hip, you can see the 3.3% higher. So from that Ziva stress study, they're saying that, okay, then when the postmenopausal woman with the uh, atrial receptor positive, uh, homoreceptor positive breast cancer, you know, if they receive the bisphosphonate with the um, uh, aromatase inhibitor at the same time, there is a protective action on the bell. Uh, again, there is a no different in incident of the fracture. So this study has uh, another uh, data, which is uh, Zephyr's trial five years. So they continue that for the five years. So again, the blue bars are all with the afferent group. As you can see that with the five year study, you can um, still preserve the bone density, both in the lumbar spine and then from um, total hip. So uh, in the group with the delay, delay group, you can see that there is uh, um, loss of the um, percent loss of the bone density. So there is a green, um, kind of like green bar there. So the green bar is that even they are in the delayed group, but they received the um, zolendronic acid as, uh, during the time of the study because they developed the non-traumatic fracture or the kind of like the bone mineral density is a little bit kind of like lower than the uh, kind of do the osteoporotic range and they will start the medication. So as you can see that even here when they start the medication, you know, even in the delay state, you still have the protective action on the bone. So that, so, so zolendronic acid, we know that there is a protective action on the bone. So how about the oral medication? So there is a separate trial. So this trial used about, I believe it's a 200 something patient. So they divided the patient into, they, they, they use a rosidronic. So um, to show that there is a prevent the bone loss in the breast cancer survivor, two years there's a randomized double blind placebo control trial. So this study is a little bit complicated. They divide the patient into um, kind of three main groups. So Low risk group mean the T score is uh, more than or equal to a negative one, and um, the, in the low risk group they will only give anastrozole. So a high risk group mean you can see the lower one, but the level is about a uh, T score of neg less than negative two, and then in that group they will give both anastrozole and the rosidronate at the same time. And about the moderate group, which is a T score of less than minus one, and the more than or equal to negative two, and then they will double blind that group and then randomize that moderate risk group into um, whether you will get the uh, anastrozole and rosidronate or aladronate, uh, sorry, uh, anastrozole and then placebo. So there are four lines here. The top line, yellow one, is a high risk group. So high risk group got the both AI and then um, bisphosphonate at the same time. As you can see that, you know, at the end of the trial, like 24 month, you can see still have the percent increase in the bone mineral density from the baseline. So second blue line is the moderate uh, risk group who got the uh, anastrozole and the rosidronate. Uh, it's kind of like randomized group. Still, they have that. Um, what is that called? Increase in the bone density, the percent change. So uh, only thing that I want to point out is the low risk group. So because of the, there is a question about low risk group, they didn't got any bisphosphonate to protect their bone. So with the anastrozole, you can see that there is a dramatic kind of like decrease in the bone density in both uh, lumbar spine and then um, total hip. So it's obviously showing that even with the rosidronate or a medication can kind of protect the bone loss. So the same thing as the denosumab has a uh, protective effect in this study. Uh, there's about two years of placebo control trial, 250 postmenopausal women. You can see the yellow line, um, the line with the yellow dot are all with the uh, denosumab. So lumbar spine, total hip, and femoral net, they can preserve the, you can see the increase in the um, percent change from the baseline from the two years um, from the treatment. So this is a current. This study is the ABCSG 18 trial. So this study is the first study that look into the the incidence of the new uh, fracture as their you know primary outcome. So this is um, kind of like black and white, so you can't really see that. But on the top there, there is a um, placebo and then the denosumab group. So denosumab group there is a 
um, like less new vertebral fracture rate um, in that group compared to the placebo. So also have a also they also show that there is a delay in the uh, the time to the first fracture. Also show the increase in the bone and density in the both three sides, the like lumbar spine, total hip, and the femur and neck. So either medication is fine, like uh, anti-resorptive bisphosphonate or the denosumab show they really improve in the bone and density in those population. So when you compare that what medication you have to use, again, oral bisphosphonate, ibendronate have not a lot of the data. So uh, for me, so I won't choose the ibendronate to begin with in my, you know, in my patient if I see her first. So, uh, but we have uh, uh, data about the residronate or either zolendronate will be good. So they mentioned that all the oral bisphosphonate limit efficacy, and then again follow up, you know, with the dosing guideline will be a little bit tricky. So uh, you can consider that, but you know, not a lot of, not really kind of a good first choice. Um, so IV bisphosphonate is a really good medication to use. Um, really have a well-established kind of data with the osteoporosis and the AIBL setting. Um, denosumab, they have a couple of study after the two that I, uh, their the recent study about the Japanese population also pretty well with the denosumab in the, there's the AIBL population. So either one is okay, but um, they are saying that if the patient is on this medication, you know, do the um, Dexter as usual and after the, based on the T-score and, um, you know, you can do the non-pharmacological therapy or you can kind of like choose the best force when it, uh, basically it's a to start with the same time or even delay, a little bit delay is okay, but as long as you start the best force when it, you can protect the bone. So this is all my reference. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for listening. Yes. No, I saw that most of the studies are, yeah, all the studies that I read about the Q6 month. Okay. Yeah. And then also, I thought denosumab was technically approved for AI induced bone loss. At least it's in the package insert, but is oh. it like an FDA? Or I guess I don't really know what you meant by that. The so paper that I read, they mentioned that, I mean, it, Please correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, I may have a deprivation therapy, but I don't know about it. Maybe it's for having like metastatic disease mm -hmm. as opposed to. So only specifically not ex -jiva, I thought was mm -hmm. approved for okay. a while. Yeah, that's I thought it was in a package insert. Mm. So, so these guidelines, um, the, are these general, so if the T square is better than minus two, mm -hmm. the patient has not had a fracture. The, the standard of care is not to start a it's possible. Mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. And is the T-score at any, is it lumbar spine, hip, either? That is, if it's less than minus two. Either, so. either side, yeah, yes. Either. Mm -hmm. But I believe we sort of, uh, with the other study, like a frenzy for studies, so I think you should start at the same time so that you can protect the bone. Yeah. Because we definitely know that the effect of the um, AI on the bone is really bad, so. I saw a patient this week who has, and she has hyperparathyroidism. And um, she has breast cancer and she was just put on bromazine. And, I, and her T-score was not you know, better than minus, uh, minus two. And she told me that her oncologist is not happy with me <laughs> because I didn't put her. And I said, well, it wasn't my understanding that we treat everybody Mm -hmm. Independent of what their bone density is. And so, anyway, she told me, Well, my oncologist is upset. And I'm, so I said, Okay, we'll have a yeah. discussion. So yeah, update with my case is that again she has a baseline of the T score is already minus three. Yeah. So at the at that time when we kind of like see the patient, we supposed to give her at least on the denosumab or something. But she was put on the ibendronate. Again, there is a no enough data to show that ibendronate is really have an effect on the EIBL. So uh, patient has that multiple fracture, and what the oncologist did was that he kind of like switched the medication from the azimostain to tamoxifen. So again, tamoxifen have a not you know sign of the side effects. So I'm not sure what would happen to the patient but they already switched to tamoxifen. But from us is that Ibendronate is on her uh, in the system for about five months, but she already had the baseline osteoporosis and then the medication was initiated pretty much delay after, you know, um, aromatase inhibitors. So for us is that we switched to the denosumab so to see what will happen. So she already received first dose. So yeah, hopefully things will get better, but I don't know what will happen next. Yeah. Dr. Peter, there is someone that believe that bifosphonate will help to reduce the risk of bone metastasis. Oh yes, they also mentioned that too in that in those papers. So yeah. they, they they say maybe it's better to treat everyone. <laughs>
Yeah. And also because they say minus more than two, but then my this code minus one point five is a risk factor, so mm -hmm. it's not really more than two. It's kind of yeah. Yeah. No, you could you could make an argument to be yeah. much more proactive because it's so common. To I'm proactive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And again, Terry Pertype for Taylor is contraindicated because her radiation therapy just to finish all these. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much for having me for these two weeks and learning tons from Columbia faculty, also from all of you. So now that I soaked it in, I'll talk for a few minutes before I send you all home. Yeah. Um, so I'll talk about primary hyperaldosteronism as an underappreciated threat to bone health. Oh, my picture got cut off. That's definitely not me, because <laughs> I quit ballet when I was 12, and I was I was never able to do that. OK. But I thought it was a great skeleton. OK. So purposes of the talk are to present an interesting case and request feedback from our preceptor and my fellow fellows on how to proceed. Um, to review the relationship between hyperaldosteronism and hyperparathyroidism, um, which I think will take pieces from several talks that already happened today, um, which is the great part about endocrinology that everything interacts. Um, to review the effects of hyperaldosteronism on bone and to propose that hyperaldosteronism should be added to a list of secondary causes of osteoporosis. Um, so this is the case, a uh, 57-year-old retired male engineer, um, he has a history of resistant hypertension, uncontrolled unnamed lodipine, lisinopril, and metoprolol. Uh, he was admitted December 2016 for acute onset of blurry vision, found to have a pituitary macroadenoma with visual changes, um, needed surgery. Um, over between December and May, he ended up having three transphenoidal surgeries. Um, he is now panhypopituitary. He has some mild diabetes insipidus. He's on hydrocortisone levothyroxine replacement. Um, we had a little insurance issue, but <clears throat> now he's on testosterone. And he takes desmopressin just at bedtime as needed. Um, and of note for him, his sister also had um, Cushing's disease. And so when I met him for the pituitary issue, he also noted that he had had hypokalemia for a few months as low as 2.5, um, requiring replacement. He had gone to a different hospital. So I said, well, that's a problem. Let's, that's not normal. Let's look it up. Um, and workup uh, biochemistry revealed primary hyperaldosteronism and his CT found a bilateral approximately one centimeter adrenal masses, which by Hounsfield units and contrast washout are um, adenomas. And they were a stable size when I repeated um, CAT scan a year later. Um, so what we're going to be focusing on is his hyperaldosteronism and what I should be doing for him, because um, he's very active. He is not that old. There's plenty of decades left to worry about his bones and fracture risk. OK. So for hyperaldosteronism, hyperparathyroidism, they're interconnected, uh, but the chicken or the egg, which comes first, um, probably with some patient presentations, it would be um, hard to find. OK, so the overall point um, for the next few studies that I will show you, um, I like to just make the tables big, and I don't always uh, write out as much. But um, basically, that um, hyperaldosteronism um, induces a secondary hyperparathyroidism. And there have been uh, many studies looking at the, this is not in the right place. Okay, interesting. Um, well, that's the, so that's the idea which many studies have found, but some disagree. In terms of difference of calcium parathyroid hormone, urinary excretion of calcium, um, whether it correlates um, with the aldosterone levels, whether there's improvement after treatment. Um, 
That's pretty much it. So secondary hyperparathyroidism from hyperaldosteronism. Um, so here are important things to note. So this was the, most of these studies are perspective with small, um, like under 200 patients. Um, and there are, none of them are from the US. Actually, most are from Italy um, and a few other countries. Um, so this one's Italian. Um, looking at, you see the difference beside PTH improving. So the idea is that um, secondary hyperpara, you have um, hypercalciuria and have a lower serum calcium um, when hyperaldosteronism has not been treated. Um, and then follow up, all these patients were just um, aldosterone producing adenomas and they were treated with adrenalectomy. Um, so you can see that the uh, urinary calcium in this study did not change, which is, um, was not considered a significant difference. Um, but the PTH was, so the PTH has significantly decreased and the calcium um, looks kind of small in these units, um, but increased. So two out of the three parameters in this study. Um, and then, so that one was perspective from 2011. Also Italian study in 2012 perspective. This looked at um, not just patients with adenoma, but also patients with uh, treated for a bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. So not just surgical, but also medical management. Um, and again, showing so on the left, these that is the uh, comparing the patients with adrenal adenoma um, at baseline and then at follow up, um, mostly after surgi surgical management. And so you see here, um, PTH calcium and now the 24 hour um, urinary calcium excretion um, decreased and all three were significant. So that's one thing to note, suggesting that the secondary hyperparathyroidism is reversible. Um, and then on the right, the significant finding that um, is useful for the point I'm making um, is that the PTH decreased um, compared to the adrenal adenoma versus primary hyperpara. Oh. Yes, same point. Good. Okay. Uh, okay. And this one is bilateral and I don't know, before and after treatment. Okay. Good. So same idea. And you see the um, visual effect of the PTH. And these are the gray is after surgery and the black is after mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist treatment. So um, reinforcing the same points a couple times. Um, just a meta-analysis, which also um, puts a lot of these studies together. Um, again, showing that there is association of PTH and calcium levels uh, with primary aldosteronism. Okay. And then uh, this one, another perspective study, um, also having a nice visual to show the same points. Um, that post-op the calcium goes up, the PTH goes down, um, and this happens with spironolactone treatment or surgery. Okay, and then um, this study was in France, yes, our one French study. Um, also perspective looking at patients with hyperaldosteronism to see if there's any predictive uh, value and in fact looking at patients um, have a PTH greater than one, greater than 100 um, are likely to have a higher aldosterone level. So this isn't um, saying which came first exactly, but the association. So this would be something where it gets a little bit more uh, complicated. Um, also the preoperative aldosterone and the preoperative PTH levels both um, can uh, significantly predict the aldosterone levels. So the 134 number is all of the patients in the study. And then the 62 are patients um, with hyperaldo who are not on hypertensive, uh, antihypertensive medication specifically. Um, but it holds, it holds in the general population either, that it has nothing to do with the medications that they might have been taking. Okay, um, kind of more of the same, another Italian study. I'll shoot past, okay. 
So I hammered the point home. Hyperpara and hyperaldo have a relationship, but why does this matter for the bone preceptorship? Um, so obviously they affect each other and when you have hyperaldosteronism, in fact, there is a risk of fracture, um, which is concerning, so it's important to note. Okay, so this was a, their study I stole as my final uh, objective to prove primary aldosteronism as a cause of secondary osteoporosis. Um, the study was also perspective in 2013, Italian again, um, 116 primary aldosterone patients, 70 of whom had bilateral adrenal hyperplasia, 46 with an adenoma, um, compared to 110 essential hypertension um, patients as controls, um, and showing up to two years after surgery or the medical management, the PTH improves, um, but also you'll notice the Z scores uh, before and after treatment are significant significantly um, changed, even though the absolute numbers suggesting um, are pretty good, um, still noticing the change. And again, this is considering there might be a risk factor for bone loss down the line. Um, it would be good to know that at least some of these losses are reversible, uh, same as we heard from the talk about Cushing syndrome, that's sort of thing. Um, and then the nice visual showing the, the Z-score point. And uh, so showing the prevalence of osteoporosis and fracture, um, another Italian study from different author in 2017. Um, these were patients with primary aldo, uh, 213 had osteoporosis, another 103 didn't. Um, and there wasn't, um, Comparing the incidence rate in these populations, there wasn't more likely to diagnose hyperaldosteronism in the osteoporotic cohort, if you kind of looked at it that way, which is a little bit backwards. Um, but it does show, you know, again, that the hyperaldosteronism uh, cohort has uh, hypercalciuria, again, the increased, um, the hyperparathyroidism. Um, it also shows, um, I made that, that arrow red, because there's, it's not, it's cut off, it doesn't quite reach statistical significance. Um, I guess you actually can see right on the edge here. Uh, but there's a trend towards a uh, very increased percent of osteoporosis and vertebral fracture um, in the primary aldosterone population, um, which is concerning. Okay. So um, this study is from Korea. This is pretty recent from uh, JCEM earlier this year. Um, looking at the primary aldo and the um, quartiles of the PAC, comparing to BMD uh, for aerial DEXA, and then also looking at trabecular bone score um, and finding that the trabecular bone score was um, at the extreme correlated and might be a better predictor of um, bone loss in these patients compared to doing a DEXA in terms of assessing their risk. That the highest quartile of the most severe hyperaldo um, had significantly the lowest trabecular bone score compared to the lowest quartile of aldosterone. Um, and probably the study was empowered enough to find more nuanced um, differences potentially. So this sort of study in a larger population um, I think would be potentially very helpful. Okay, and this is a study from 2017 in Japan, um, also showing a higher prevalence of uh, vertebral fracture, um, as you can see on, on the left. Um, so I cut out some models in the middle because they looked at metabolic parameters, not part of this discussion. Um, but model one is adjusted for age, sex, and BMI, and then when you adjust for um, bone mineral density, um, you do see that the uh, vertebral fracture risk, it, the effect goes away. And then also looking at the severe fracture, I'm um, comparing with and without uh, vertebral fracture, um, then over here, it's so I circled them because it is significant. Um, so it's showing that primary aldosteronism patients had a higher prevalence of more severe fractures as well. And then, okay, yep, this is the first one. Sorry, the 
source got totally cut off there. Um, so this was a 2017 retrospective nationwide um, study in using a database in Taiwan um, from 1997 to 2010, um, looking at 2,500 patients with primary ALDO, including 921 with adenomas. It's a case control via propensity score. Um, so this study was uh, finding some effects that were kind of specific to the next slide here uh, in females, um, which is uh, interesting, but still of note that females who are on mineral corticoid receptor treatment had a higher risk of osteoporosis and fracture, um, which was not the case after adrenalectomy. Um, so again, was there any disadvantage to having medical management versus surgery if you're able to offer surgery? Not totally sure. And also why this is only in women, don't know. Okay. And then a 2016 perspective case controlled study from Malaysia um, looking at patients who were referred for secondary hypertension to a clinic. Um, 18 had primary hyperaldo and 17 matched, so a small study um, with hypertension, but primary aldo patients had significantly higher bone turnover markers, um, but no difference in bone mineral density. However, three months after they were treated for hyperaldo, um, they had lower bone turnover markers, PTH, and a higher lumbar spine um, bone density, um, although not, not significant. Okay, and then uh, the question of whether specifically looking at if the primary the primary hyperaldo causing secondary hyperpara, um, whether that's going to occur, the severity of it, if it might distinguish among the different types of the etiologies of hyperaldosteronism would be interesting. So it could potentially pinpoint patients where you really want to do um, the ABS um, sampling for lateralization. Um, so the data for this is mixed. Um, so this was a 2016 perspective study from China. Um, it had 242 patients with primary hyperaldo, 82 had the adenoma, um, 34 per had unilateral hyperplasia, and the rest had bilateral adrenal hyperplasia, um, matched to 120 essential hypertension um, control patients. Um, so this suggests that the, the increase in PTH does not correlate, um, and for some reason the only difference was that the um, unilateral hyperplasia, no, the bilateral hyperplasia patients have a uh, higher creatinine. This I don't know why, but that was their only finding, which um, really doesn't help us. Um, however, the, this was the 2012 paper from Italy, again, um, did show uh, a comparison. The adenoma versus the bilateral adrenal hyperplasia patients um, had an almost significant um, difference with a higher, uh, with the calcium, and with the, the PTH was significant. And you can see it's higher in bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. Um, versus primary hyperaldo and then 113, but much higher in the adenoma when you, it's the leftmost column and then the one to the right of where it's circled. So, food for thought. Okay, so a summary, um, some conflicting data, but, but basically to understand one endocrine organ is to understand them all, because there's clearly an adrenal zona glomerulosa, bone, parathyroid, kidney, axis. Um, a likely mechanism could be that primary hyperaldosteronism um, induces hypercalceria, which causes secondary hyperparathyroidism, um, and through mechanisms previously discussed, increases bone loss um, and in fracture risk. Um, conversely, primary hyperparathyroidism also can cause secondary hyperaldosteronism, resulting in secondary hypertension, which we know is common amongst these patients. Um, and I even, I didn't put it here, but there's been um, studies of PTH receptors found on um, aldosterone producing adrenal adenomas. Um, so there's definitely a relationship. Conflicting studies as to whether bone-related biochemical parameters can distinguish among specific etiologies of primary hyperaldo. Um, 
so osteoporosis secondary to hyperaldosteronism is reversible with medical or surgical management, um, but it confers a potentially increased risk of fracture when untreated, including worsened fracture severity is also um, of note, and future directions. Question is, should um, patients with hyperaldosteronism be screened for osteoporosis? How much of a risk factor is should this be? Um, only if, if they're found to be hypercalciuric, should we be checking 24-hour urine in patients with primary hyperaldosteronism, which is not routinely done? Um, and is it reasonable to treat these patients who have um, hypertension empirically with uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists? Um, if you don't want to, if they don't want to do like more of a workup, would that be a reason to, in in a certain cohort, maybe with hypercalciuria, to want to move that up on your preference of antihypertensive medications? So in conclusion about my patient, I would say that um, I'm not too worried about him. He's not hyperparathyroid. We, we checked, especially with his likely MEN type um, presentation. Um, and he is compliant with aplerinone. So most of the studies said that medical management would be OK, because he definitely doesn't want to do the, the sampling unless he can be sure he'll get cured, which I can't promise. So um, thank you. Good, thank you. Okay. Um.